see, is it going yet? Okay, uh, so we are live. Um, I'm going to tell everybody. Welcome to the second four-hour block of uh, A Day of Life, Ray. Um, we are going to start this time slot uh, with Ray OJ, uh, but not with Ray only. We're actually going to play a little game of developer Jeopardy. Um, we've got uh, Vamsi. Vamsi, what's your full name? It's Gita Ragu Vamsi something. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's Gita Ragu Vamsi. Yeah, it's a, it, it's a, it's it's a bit long. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So Vamsi is a good true name. <laughs> uh, we also have uh, Neil Griffin uh, from the previous session and uh, Ray OJ uh, from Life Ray. So we're gonna play a little game. So I'm gonna join. Um, so this is typical uh, Jeopardy rules. You should be familiar with them. Um, if I can find my here we go. Uh, here. Okay. So, uh, Vamsi, you're going to be team one. Neil, you're going to be team two. And Ray is going to be team three. And I'm going to share my screen okay. right now. So, here we go. So, um, so like I said, it's, this is you know standard uh, Jeopardy rules. Um, at the end, we'll have a final Jeopardy question. Um, and so uh, team one is going to be playing. I'm going to just randomly pick people in uh, in IRC again. So team one is going to be playing for Dark OS or Dark OS, uh, and then team two is going to be. Let's see who's been chatting recently. Um, we'll go with Saf plus plus. Saf or safe? I don't know. Um, and then team three will be. Uh, Let's see, who can we find? Uh, I'll pick Quattro P. Yeah, there you go, Quattro P, you got it. You came up like right when I uh, said that, that was awesome. Okay, uh, cool. So, um, so the winner is, um, let's see, uh, the winner is going to win a Raspberry Pi. Um, if you're familiar, if you're not familiar with Raspberry Pi, it's a little hardware board that you can do prototyping and other interesting electronic gadgetry on. You can actually run LifeRay on it. Uh, our team, I believe it was in Spain, uh, was able to run a Java VM on it and then LifeRay inside. Uh, so, so the winner uh, will win a Raspberry Pi. So uh, Vamsi and Neil and, and Ray, you guys are playing for uh, for your fellow community denizens. So I'm going to randomly choose. Uh, uh, Neil to start us off. So it can, the, the categories are life right isms, class dismissed, languages, captains of industry, and programming. So Neil, <laughs> go for it. I'll take life right isms for 100. Okay. Set this property to true to load the themes merge CSS files for faster loading for production. JavaScript fast load. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You're very close. Uh, uh, anyone else? I'll give. I'll say. Um, I don't know. Ten seconds for each for each one. So eh, you were close. It's theme.css.fastload.load. Uh, I should so, have listened to the question more closely. So Neil gets negative one hundred. So we need somebody on sound effects here. Uh, okay. So uh, Neil, since you started this off, you get to pick again. Life realisms for two hundred. There's no place like this directory in which Liferay recommends you place your portal-ext dot properties. Well, I'm a trainer, and there's like several places we recommend. So, I like to put it in Liferay home. Yes, correct. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. So, Jeopardy rules. You got to frame the answer as a question. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Um, uh, what is what, what is what is Liferay home? Correct. What is the Liferay home directory? Very good. So people always put it in like WebInf classes, and which gets blown away every time you read a plural. Right. So, so good. Uh, so you're you're plus hundred. So you get to go again. And by the way, Ray and uh, and Vops, you guys can jump in. It's not just yeah, Neil yeah. answering questions. Yeah. So. Okay. Life for three hundred. This library framework, introduced in library six, allows, among other things, to graphically measure activity of blogs, wikis, and forums. Uh. What's the name of this? What is, what is monitoring? No. Uh, what is uh, 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 it's the measuring statistics? Uh. Social activity. <laughs> yeah. 
That's the one. Oh, uh, <laughs> correct. Wait a minute. Who is that? Navin, you're not supposed to be playing. What is social value? <laughs> Navin is a light. Yeah, Navin, you're cheating. Uh, the no, you're all wrong. So, actually, Navin was right, but he's not playing. So, uh, <laughs> it was actually uh, what is a social activity? Also called social equity. Social equity, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, okay. So, Neil, keep going. Life free essence for four hundred. What? With one of the longest signatures in LifeRay's public API, this method can sometimes make you seem older than you really are. User local service util. What what is user local service util dot validate? Uh, uh, Authenticate by email address. No. <laughs> Which method is the longest signature in LifeRay API? <laughs> so the correct answer is user local service util dot add user. There's like a thousand, all the I don't know how, yeah, all the parameters. Right, right. It's right, right. <laughs> oh yeah, right, yeah, because it has all the atomic parameters, right? People make fun of that all the time. Like yeah. people who want to uh, to make fun of Wi-Fi say, oh look at that method, that's ridiculous. Okay. I so, have the right class. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so next, keep going, Neil. Nobody's gotten it right yet. All right, life reasons for 500. These two related web service protocols developed by Kacho Technology have been supplanted by JSON and SOAP as the primary web service protocol supported by LifeRay. MongoDB. Uh, Incorrect. Incorrect. 500. <laughs> this is a LifeRayism? Hessian and Burlap? Incorrect, Ray. What is Hessian and Burlap? Correct. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So finally, we got somebody else. Okay, Ray, you're up. So Ray gets to pick. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll go. I'll go languages for two hundred. I think okay. it was <laughs> ten. Print hello world. What is Perl? Incorrect. Can't see your screen. Uh, you can't see my screen? Oh, there we go. Okay. Oh, what is basic? Correct. Ah, you yeah. got it. You guys are all in the hole. <laughs> the Atari right, 400 Neil. was my first computer, so... You're next. I'm next? Yep. Well, you, you have control of the board. Uh, okay, languages for 100. I'm not even going to try and pronounce it. What is... Uh, uh, um, mm, 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 mm. ASM, assembly. Correct. Language. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Good job. All right, you're only 100 down. All right, ready you next. Languages for 300. Yeah. What is C? C. What is C no. plus? Correct. Ah. You got it. <laughs> Are you sure that's not valid C as well? <laughs> it's the double colon, I think. Yeah, the, and um, the and the double uh, whatever they're called, angle right. brackets. Yeah. Okay, Neil. Languages for four hundred. What is Lisp? What is, oh, yes, correct. Too fast. He's the quick draw. Yep. Ray, you have control of the board. Languages for five hundred. What is Fortran? Correct. Very good. Ray's on a roll. Five hundred for that one. All right. Next, Ray. All right. Captain, captains of industry for 100, I guess. We'll start at the bottom. This Oasis standard allows portlets to execute on faraway servers and render locally. What is WSRP? Correct. If, if uh, I got a question for you. If, if you know the answer, do you, do you politely wait for the guy whose turn it was, <laughs> or do you blurt it out? You blurt it out as soon as I'm done speaking. <laughs> so, Since we so don't have buzzers. We don't have yes. buzzers? Okay. We don't have, I, yeah, I should start buzzing you guys. Let me see if the buzzer works. Let's see. Yeah. <laughs> you guys are screwed. All right, Ray, go next. Uh, let's carry on with Captains of Industry for 200. This, the name of this app server refers to its transparent development, not its smell. What is Glassfish? Correct. And we need like a, a ding. What if there's a ding? No. All right, so you got plus. So you're in a, yeah, you're a plus 100 here. Okay. Um, Next, go, Neil. Uh, let's try 
Class dismissed for 100. Theme and web content template developers can find declarations of their favorite variables in this core class, which is gone as of Liferay 6.2. What is velocity variable such Java? Correct. Good job. Man, we need a ding. I didn't All know right. that was going in 6.2, actually. Yeah, I didn't know either. And I, went to, I, I told somebody about it. I'm like, go look in velocity variables. And I went to look, and it's gone. It's, it's actually. What, did that get replaced by something? Or? Yes. Yeah, it's still there. I mean, it's still replaced. <laughs> it's, called, so. uh, it's called template helper util, templates context helper. Okay. Something like that, yeah. <laughs> OK, uh, go, Neil. You're next. Uh, class dismissed for 200. Running out of room in this area of JVM memory can leave you stranded for a very, very long Perm time. Permgen. What, what is Permgen? Perm Perm uh, Ray, you got minus on that one. <laughs> and I think that I heard uh, Neil spoke up. No, no, Ray was first. Yeah, but he I... didn't say it right. Oh. Oh, his, yeah, I didn't his... do the what is. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I think you and Vomsi. We'll give it to Vomsi because he, he needs uh, some help here. So. Here we go. Let's be so Vomsi, you're next. You're, you got control of the board. OK. Uh... Uh, captains of Industry, 400. 400. Yeah. Alloy UI is derived from this popular web component framework. What is YUI? What is YUI? What is YUI? I heard Neil first. So Neil wins that one. All right, Neil, you're next. Shit, man. I like class dismissed <laughs> for 300. OK. Wave goodbye to anonymous inner classes with these expressions slated for Java 8. What are lambdas? Correct. Very good. Neil is. Just kicking you guys' butt. Okay, <laughs> so let me make sure. They're lame expressions, but we'll accept. Okay. Yeah, there you go. Okay, yeah. Neil. Class dismissed for 400. This species of tree has spirally arranged leaves with lobed margins and, in some cases, serrated leaves. Also, the original name for the Java programming language. What is oak? Correct. Very good. Well, I'll get you a little. Yeah. Okay, Neil. You're next. Class dismissed for 500. The first four bytes of every Java class definition equals this hexadecimal string, and it has nothing to do with Gosling's favorite barista. Java. What is Java? <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> that was in minus 500 for you there, Ray. Yeah, that's You fine. guys don't know this one? Ah, wait, let me get the buzzer. All right, it's uh, Cafe Babe, C-A-F-E-B-A-B-E. -E. That's the magic number of every Java class oh. in the world. <laughs> OK, uh, next. Uh, I think, Neil, you're still in control. Um, programming for 100. Oops. Oh, that's wrong. What is programming? <laughs> Life Race Service Builder generates code distantly related to this gang of four design pattern, focusing on decoupling and abstraction from its high-level implementation. What is separation of concerns? No. Oh. It's a uh, gang of four design pattern. What is the factory pattern? Negative. No. I need the buzzer. You guys are getting negatives here. All right. So the correct response is, what is the bridge pattern? Mm. OK. Neil? Programming for 200. Chain of responsibility pattern is very often observed in Unix commands and in this classic Java EE specification. What is JSF? Negative. Well, it's got to be. <laughs> actually, I guess I would, could technically accept that. So we'll go with that. I was actually looking for the servlet spec. Yeah, I know the JSF spec uses that like crazy. All right. How, okay. how, about, how, about, how about I get zero for that? <laughs> OK. OK. Next. Uh, programming for 300. Many instances of spring beans follow this lonely but sometimes happy what is design singleton? pattern. Correct. Uh, yeah. on, Maybe Bob, there's a... that, that's not fair because I've got Vernon Singleton on my team. <laughs> we were just joking that he was the inventor of the singleton pattern. And nice. Crush on the brain. All right. Neil? Programming for 400. Name two of the seven basic Java annotations introduced in the Java 5 platform. What is uh, pre-destroy, and what is uh, uh, no? Po okay. <laughs> <laughs> Need another cup of coffee for that one. 
<laughs> Anyone else want to give it a shot? Oh, I get negative for that. All right. Uh, no, it is. Um, well, I'll show you what they are. Oops. So here they are. Oh, here they go. Suppress there. warnings. <laughs> yep, suppress warnings. Yeah, one of them. deprecated. Sure. I was thinking yep. about overwrite. Yeah, yeah pre-destroy yeah. is actually in a different uh, jar. Yep. Yeah. These are in java.lang and yeah. java.lang yeah. annotations. All right, Neil. Um, programming for five hundred. This programming concept introduced in the 1960s is the basis for many of today's event-driven programming paradigms. What is model view controller? Negative. Oh. What is message passing? No. Vomsi, you care to guess? No. <laughs> the answer is closures. No. Oh, okay. All right, Neil. Captains of Industry 300. This Finnish developed view and I framework is included in life What is Vaden? What is Vaden? Uh, I'm going to give it to Ray because he's oh, uh, he's lagging. So Ray, you get the last one. Actually, here's the last one. This acronym for properties of reliable databases is sometimes brushed aside in OS What is solutions. acid? Correct. All right. You pulled ahead at the last second. I mean, you didn't pull ahead, but you're positive. We, we <laughs> <laughs> so, Vamsi, uh, I'm sad to say you're uh, in, in the negative territory, so you won't be able to yeah, participate no in problem. the final Jeopardy question. But uh, here we go with the final Jeopardy question, if I can find it. Um, What's it worth? It is, oh, yeah, you got to, so the category is source code management systems. Oh. So, Neil, how much do you want to risk? <laughs> of your 600 points. Logic would st state 100 would be enough. <laughs> uh, I, I suppose I'll be illogical and try 200. Okay. Ray, you want to go with <laughs> everything, I guess? All right, 100. All right, so you're going to have 10 seconds, maybe 15 seconds. Okay, here we go. This term, widely used in graph theory, describes how individual revisions are connected to each other in a given project. 15 seconds. Don't shout it out. Actually, you should write it on a piece of paper or on a text editor or something. Like what is an abstract syntax tree? No. Negative. So it's a branch? Negative. It's a directed acyclic <laughs> graph or DAG. Oh, okay. <laughs> Widely used in graph theory. That's the that's the um, the clue. So so that means that who won? I believe Neil won. Yeah. Yes, Neil won. So, so how did I end up? With, how did I end up with minus four hundred? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, I clicked the wrong button. <laughs> <laughs> you have <to> zero. <laughs> okay, so SAF plus plus, I believe, wins. So SAF, congrats. Congratulations, SAF plus plus. You're the proud owner of a Raspberry Pi. Got to get this out. I'll never remember it if I don't write it down. So, okay, cool. So, um, thanks guys for playing along. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, and let's see who else is online. Uh, so Vamsi and uh, Navin, if we play this again later today or tonight with India, you guys are not allowed to play. So yeah. Uh, <laughs> so and, I mean, is, is uh, James? Is it the same questions you're gonna shoot? I then? don't know. <laughs> we'll see. I was actually gonna make another one, but I don't know if I have enough time. Okay, we okay. actually have uh, a different different game I want to play with India as well. So a version of closest to the pin. So we'll do that later. Okay. Okay. So. Again, uh, I was not playing. I was not playing in this game. I wasn't participated. Okay, good. Yeah, but you saw all the questions and answers, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so I'm going to mute you guys. So, Vance, you got to be back on mute patrol. So, with us, we have Ray Ajay, who participated in the game just now. Um, welcome, Ray. Um, so, Ray is one of our uh, senior developers at LifeRay. Um, and so, Ray, why don't you go ahead and give us the basics, introduce yourself, and tell us what you do at LifeRay. Um... So, I'm a I'm a senior architect at LifeRay. Uh, 
one of one of the senior architects at LifeRay, not not the the senior architect at LifeRay, but uh, I live in Northern Ontario, Canada, so I'm not I'm uh, I, I work from home, uh, like a lot of the other gentlemen we've seen uh, do. Uh, this is my, my office. It's also the basement of our house. Um, so, yeah, on a day-to-day, -day, it's just working with a lot of people from all over the world and uh, trying to solve architectural problems that, that we have. So, uh, speaking of architectural problems, I know you've done a lot of work on OSGI and the modularization of life rate, and it is actually a really popular topic. So, um, can you spend some time talking about what the plans are, what, what's, what's already in LifeRay, and what uh, your plans are for uh, further exposing and making LifeRay more modular. So where we're at right now, um, as of what's going to be released in LifeRay 6.2, are um, an OSGI framework, an embedded OSGI framework environment. So a container, an OSGI container running inside of LifeRay will be available in 6.2. Um, what this container will have access to is uh, all of the services that LifeRay uh, has internally will be automatically available from the, 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 the OSGI framework environment. Um, so that's, that's an interesting uh, piece. Uh, another interesting... Uh, detail is that um, most of the core or, or all of the core classes that are available inside of the life rate core are going to be accessible for direct interaction from the OSGI container so for instance you want to modify the behavior of portal util uh, one of the key core classes in LifeRay. Traditionally, you'd have to write an EX, use an EXT environment, which basically overlays your code with the LifeRay source code, and uh, that's how you end up with your result. And uh, the problem with that is that it's problematic as far as maintenance and upgrades and so on. You end up with pos potential conflicts and, and whatnot. So what will be possible in the OSGI uh, container will be to say, oh, I want to extend portal impl with my own implementation and so I'll have direct access to that class I'll be able to extend it actually say in my class you know extends portal impl and then inject that class into the wrapper so thereby altering the behavior without having to re-implement the whole thing not only that I'll be able to deploy it hot deploy it without having to take down life ray and uh, that's going to be one of the very interesting features. Um, the goal there is to uh, eliminate complete dependency on uh, the EXT environment. At least for the vast majority of cases, we want to eliminate EX the need for EXT. Um, what else is going to be available? Uh, we're going we're going to have out of the box support for um, the HTTP service, which is part of uh, of uh, the OSGI specifications, basically what that means is similar to what you're going to have in, in in similar to what you have in uh, Servlet 3.0, which is being able to define your servlets purely by annotation. Uh, actually, I think it's in 2.6. Uh, Neil can correct me uh, on that. Um, where you can define your servlets by annotations alone without needing a web, web XML file. You'll be able to do the same thing from OSGI uh, just by annotating a servlets or, uh, or filters and then deploying them as a very minimalistic jar file with the correct metadata and then deploy that in the life rate and have it behave as some new, connect, new web endpoint in your application. Um, so basically what we're trying to do is we're trying to simplify uh, the life of the developer just like was mentioned by Brian earlier. Um, the key problem is that I'm seeing uh, from my years uh, working with LifeRay is that um, we end up with 
significant amount of life race specific APIs, life race specific ways of doing things, um, which forces developers to kind of follow our path for how things, how we think things should be done. So what we're trying to do with OSGI is one of the things we're trying to do with OSGI is to basically simplify things so we can actually uh, reduce the barrier to entry the, the, to developing on LifeRay and make it uh, a lot more accessible to uh, a larger class of developers. And that might sound uh, like it goes against what most people understand of OSGI because I think the common understanding that people have is that OSGI is really, really complicated. And that's not wrong, but I think <laughs> <laughs> what I think it does, however, is it affords the architect who is building an application like LifeRays that has a lot of complexity to use the functionality of the OSGI specifications to actually simplify things. Um, for instance, uh, you can't uh, let, let's take uh, for for example deployment. An another aspect is is maintenance. Sorry, I'm gonna switch now to maintenance and and the amount of work that Lifer has to do to make its functionality exist. For instance, uh, hot deploy. Uh, Lifer provides hot deployment for plugins in virtually every web app server that we we support. Uh, this is it's clever and it's very useful, but it also means that it's a functionality that LifeRay itself has to maintain. And that piece of functionality has to be aware of every different app server and all the different intricacies that all those different app servers have. And how do you deal with that? Well, we basically deal with it by globbing together huge logic that says, you know, when you're in this app server, behave this way. If you're in this app server, behave this way, and so on and so on, and so on and so forth. And, it, and that really complicates our lives. Um, one, it ties our, our our dependency to the app servers. It means that we have to support a lot more code that's specific to a particular environment. It means that we have to maintain and improve the deployment mechanism uh, while and while we're doing that we're not improving other features of, of LifeRay. And we have uh, we have the deployment mechanism which is like that. We have the, the dependency management mechanism which is like that and, and several other mechanisms that actually have an industry specification out there already that is actually far more robust and far more rich than our own and that we would ever be able to implement on our own unless we dedicated a lot of resources to doing that and so by bringing an OSGI to the picture it actually solves a lot of those problems by just allowing us to say hey I'm gonna, just going to consume that functionality as opposed to implementing it again and then uh, because I'm going to do that I'm going to be able to spend far more time on improving other features. Um, so what's your elevator pitch for OSGI to a developer not to uh, a manager? Like what will be easier, what will be like so much better? Life rate will be better. <laughs> the the dev from the point of view, I really think that uh, the main goal or the main uh, benefit will be that LifeRay itself will be a better platform to build on. Not necessarily because we're not, I, I, or at least it's not my goal to necessarily to say, oh, our, our plugin infrastructure is now OSGI and everyone has to learn OSGI in order to use it. That's, that's not the goal. The goal is to say, Hey, LifeRay is a lot better in the next version because of OSGI than it was before. So when you're building stuff, you want to consider it a lot, a lot more. For instance, right now when you install LifeRay, uh, someone else mentioned earlier. I think it was uh, uh, Dave uh, Nebing Nebinger said LifeRay is a framework for building applications on, or at least that's how they envision it. And so they don't necessarily use the wiki. They don't necessarily use message boards or document library and so on and so forth. A lot of the canned functionality that's inside of LifeRay. But yet when they deploy LifeRay they have to live with that. They have to live with the 
cost of having that part of life right there. Um, and it's managed. It's something you have to manage. It means that your installation footprint is bigger. It means you have a lot of libraries that you have to uh, to consider being there in your deployment. A lot of a lot of actually financial institutions have to literally go through every library that LifeRay has and certify it before they can use LifeRay. So, the footprints, the memory requirements, the number of libraries, the amount of just the sheer amount of code in LifeRay is itself a problem which means that when you're going to decide to build a framework or when you're using life as a framework to build on you have to consider how that aspect of it affects you and so what the goal for OSGI is to do uh, is is to allow us to to take life rate and segment it into smaller components and therefore have a smaller footprint with the initial with the base version of life really, let's say. Um, so that'll make it more attractive to developers to deploy in the cloud, to deploy you know, on the development environment, to integrate with their IDE, um, to simply just build applications off of because they won't have to have all of these, all of this monolithic life ray installation to deal with right. uh, and all these other concerns. By so, the way, Cynthia, we're about, about 10 minutes behind, so just to let you know. So, okay. yeah, and then there's there's just about every aspect. Um, okay, let me let me take a step back. OSGI isn't really the goal. OSGI is just a means to get to the goal. The goal is sure. really modularity. Right. Modularity is what we want and what we what I'm shooting for. However, we get to that modularity really is is mostly irrelevant. It just so happens to be that the biggest uh, infrastructure uh, or the, the most, uh, uh, how should I say, the most hardened and ready to use modularity framework in the Java language just happens to be OSGI. And it has the most rich set of features that, for us to use. There's actually, there, I don't even know of another existing module. There are other modularity frameworks for for life rate, but no I mean for uh, for Java but they're not well used they're not uh, they're not as popular they don't have as much a, as of a community behind them and <laughs> or they're so, like lagging like J jigsaw has been on the books for I don't know how many years now exactly um, and so we want to go to a framework that's actually actively being developed that's uh, has a proven that that's been proven in the industry, which OSGI has, and so OSGI isn't the goal. OSGI is the means to get to the goal, right. and so um, yeah, awesome. Uh, so so like so, what's coming in six two? Um, wow. <laughs> Maybe aside from, uh, aside from OSGI, uh, are you talking specifically no, talk about from some, that? Yeah, for OSGI, what's coming in six two? So again, we're gonna have wait, the wait, container. That's my question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, we can ask Cynthia. Yeah, go ahead, Cynthia. <laughs> no, I'll I'll let James wrap up with you because I I'm actually all queued up to share all of our six two stories. Oh, cool. Uh, so, <laughs> all right, so there you go. I, I, I don't want to <laughs> take anything away from modularity. <laughs> Why is Ron lining people up? He's got another 30 minutes before he's on. I'm concerned they're going to stand there for 30 minutes. <laughs> so, just to let you guys know. Um, OK, uh, so Ray, I had one more question for you. Oh, um, so how are the maple leaves doing this year? That's a sad, sad story. They just passed <laughs> Ottawa in the, in the standings this past week. And uh, unfortunately, they are going to make the playoffs. Um, my team is actually the Ottawa Senator for Ottawa fans. Oh, okay. Out there, oh, Sens Army. And <laughs> actually, the hashtag for Sens is uh, Pesky Sens. So everyone who's an Ottawa fan, Pesky Sens. Pesky Sens. <laughs> yeah. I really want to know. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, it's, it's been a fun season. Uh, well, uh, so later today, actually in about uh, an hour, is it an hour, 2.30? Yeah, wait. Yeah, about an hour we're going to have um, the the team from uh, Savoir Fair Linux in Montreal on. 
and we're going to play a little game of uh, closest to the pin Canada style, so you might oh, be interested awesome. in that. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, um, let's see. Yeah, so uh, you can, you're, you know, you're welcome to stay on. Um, we are running, well, I guess we got about five more minutes because uh, we ran a little bit long with the Jeopardy game, so um, let's see, what else? Uh, oh, I wanted to ask you about um, another favorite subject of yours, Packle. So, um, so what is uh, what's coming in the next in the GA three release that was not in GA two? Like, what what changes are coming? <laughs> it will work. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what is Packle? First of all, I guess yeah, right. We might, yeah, we should change. Yeah, exactly. It's a very so good Packle, point. we have we Life Ray has this uh, mythical beast of a set of functionality that we've dubbed. Packle. Did you call him an ethical beast? That's actually a pretty good a name. Mythi a mythical beast. Oh, a mythical beast. Okay. Called Packle. And uh, what Packle was intended to do was, I guess, if you've been paying attention to the, to the software industry, not just the Java industry the last uh, few months, but in general to the software industry, because things are, because applications are moving to the cloud and, and people are consuming applications in foreign environments that they're not aware of or they're they're mashing up an environment uh, consuming something from from some uh, service provider in in one location and mashing that up in a, in a with some other infrastructure somewhere else and the concern is becoming security uh, this is on top of of, of the whole uh, marketplace kind of every 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 uh, platform development, or developer or software company is kind of uh, building out this marketplace paradigm where you know you can just quickly uh, get new functionality and deploy it into your environment. So one of the big concerns is uh, security. So it's 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 uh, interesting when you think about uh, taking taking a, a, an application and installing it on your mobile phone um, from some marketplace. Um, and then there's a level of security involved in, in doing that. But um, factor that against having an application inside your secured infrastructure that is connecting with uh, all of your high priority systems and then the prospect of going to a marketplace and getting some application and then bringing it into your environment and then executing that without necessarily being aware of, of what that application is really doing. And so Packle is an implementation of the Java security API to protect your infrastructure, your life ray portal primarily, and the environment where the life ray portal is installed from the potentially malicious activity of some plugin that you're in, going to install inside of LifeRay. So, so you go to the marketplace and you find some application and you think it's nifty and you want to bring it into your environment and you want to run it. Well, how safe is that? What what is the concern? There's there's an obvious concern there because you have no real you, you first of all you have no access to the to the source code most a lot of the time and uh, you need to reassure yourself that whatever this app is doing it's not going to do damage and Packle is is there to do that so in 6.1 the goal was to release marketplace uh, that was one of the big uh, f sets of functionality was being released in the EE versions of uh, uh, of 6.1 uh, so access to the marketplace and then um, we implemented a first a cut of Packle, which was the security infrastructure to protect the portal from applications and from other from applications of protecting themselves for, against other applications. And to the, the short story is is that there were a lot of problems with it. So um, we just finished in the past week, and I know there's been a lot of talk on the marketplace uh, forums and LifeRay and that. Um, it's actually been uh, a significantly depressing state of affairs for developers trying to build applications on LifeRay. Um, you know, packle this error and, and this is not working and how do I do this? And, and so we've been working furiously and tirelessly to 
make a new make a better implementation of Packle, which I've dubbed Packle version two, which is going to be released in the the GA three version of six point one and is fully part of six point two. So that should be available. I think Cynthia might be mentioning it. The the work just completed, including the full backport work, was just completed this past week, and so I don't know the timeline specifically, but uh, the releases <laughs> which include those uh, fixes, it should be imminent. Uh, okay, should be imminent. <laughs> what, I did right. Can I ask you a question? <laughs> yeah. When should I start testing the master branch? Uh, it's actually ready to go right now. Okay. So everything is in. the gener Oh, that's another thing. It was with Packle when it first came out was it was very complicated for developers to try and write a policy that addressed their application. Yeah. So we built a generator and actually Neil did a lot of work to test that out to make sure the, the, the concept actually worked and uh, that was fully tested with all of the JSF uh, Portlet Bridge implementations that we have and I don't know how long it's been since you did any more maybe recent tests on need that. To be updated, um, maybe since, I mean basically the policies I have uh, worked as of like a month and a half ago. Okay. Do you, do you, so do you think those policies would continue to work or should I run uh, they should be. Again? They should be really, they should be very, very, very close. There might be some small, minute alterations to make, but basically what this is is that a developer will be able to turn on the generation mode for their plugin, and the entire policy will write itself as they're doing a QA, uh, as they're doing a quality assurance testing on their application just before releasing it to the marketplace. That'll generate the policy for them. They have no... They, they don't really have to do anything on their own other than to just fine-tune the policy that gets generated. Uh, might be... Uh, the fine-tuning would probably more be related more to, like, the file stru file system structures available on the in the in the application and and making that more generic so it's... Uh, and there, there are ways of doing that to make it more generic so it runs on any environment. Um, but that's standard Java security policy definition type of stuff. So. Yeah, and just to let people know uh, what we're t discussing, the security access control list, uh, you probably haven't seen it if you haven't been developing for the marketplace, but right. you will eventually run into it. Um, yeah. So, well, hopefully you'll land softly, gently, like a like a mink coat. You'll just kind of slip it on over your shoulders, and it'll be good. So, uh, yeah, so, Ray, I really appreciate your time. Uh, I know that you'll be on uh, later today, hopefully. Um, you actually you might give me a, an hour or so break, which would be awesome. Um, so, yes, thank you very much, Ray. Um, and no we're, running a, we're running a little bit behind, so, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> I love my sound effects. I feel like a, I don't know, <laughs> a podcast or something. It's pretty awesome. Okay, so... Um, so we are going to move on uh, to Cynthia Wilburn. So Cynthia is here with us. I see her. Uh, hello, Cynthia. How are you? And uh, introduce yourself, who you are, what you do at LifeRay, and all those fun things. Okay. Well, hello, everyone. Um, as my lovely banner down there in my Google Hangout says, my name is Cynthia Wilburn. And um, I run the projects at LifeRay. And they, they call me the director of the program management office. But um, I think uh, more often than not, I just feel like um, it's my responsibility to, to serve every one of our staff members in some way, shape, or form in order to expedite the, the flow of their work and clear roadblocks and do all that project managey thing that uh, uh, lets people communicate, especially in a development, uh, a distributed development environment. So I, so I spend a lot of time uh, dog fooding on our n.liferay.com instance, and uh, I think that I have a nickname uh, amongst the staff as Jira Girl. So what the Jira Jockey? I'm a Jira <laughs> Jockey. <laughs> the folks at Atlassian uh, know me, um, so I, I, I spend a lot of time in our Jira instance because uh, that, that's how we're running our development teams. That's the tool that we use to run our development teams and our iterations. Cool. Okay. Um, so let's see. So here's a first leading question. Um, I'm nervous. <laughs> <laughs> what 
is what the is the average length of the... <laughs> <laughs> hey, I can bust out some trivia if you want. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so how do you, and, and maybe you can comment, maybe you can represent all of life right now. Um, how do you, being in a process-oriented position, how do you balance the need for process versus the need for innovation? That's a typical trade-off, right? You get like big companies, like they just come to a grinding halt because they've got you know huge amounts of bureaucracy, and it takes a thousand different people to sign off on something, and nothing ever gets done. And then you have you know just you know one person who's able to just go crazy and do whatever they want because there's no you know essentially no red tape. So, how do you personally, or you know, as, as a as a product manager, uh, uh, or you know, um, balance those needs? Um, well, beer. <laughs> um, <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. No problem with that. Uh, uh, cerveza, um, as our Spanish team has taught me. Um, no, but in, in all seriousness, um, we we have what a lot of agile organizations uh, build into their process, uh, something called quick wins. Um, uh, that's one way that we open up the, the, the floodgate gates for developers to make improvements and innovate in the product, product without a whole lot of um, bureaucracy, so to speak. Whereas our larger features that require uh, more time and more planning are something that uh, go through several layers of discussion, collaboration. Um, and let me, I'll, I'll explain a quick win for you. Um, our rule for a quick, in, quick win is that uh, it has to be something that can be achieved within one day's time period. And for some of our teams, depending on their location, they may just do that when there is some time in their schedule. Perhaps they're waiting for a code review to be completed before they move on to something, or there's a dependency, and there's this thing that they just know they want to do, and they're the best person to do it, and uh, they, can, they can get that in. And I know in our office in Spain, they set aside uh, Fridays for that time, since uh, their, their working schedule over there is a little bit different on Fridays. And so it lends itself really well to just work on their own things. So uh, that's one way. Uh, and so there's, there's obviously, there's limitation on the kind of things that you can get done in a single workday. Although I think I see Ray online and working about, <laughs> I don't know, maybe 18 hours a day. So. <laughs> It depends if they're inspired, I, I, but I, I think that's because he's very inspired. I think that he's passionate about the features that he's implementing, so um, I think... Yeah, we're not real sure about Ray, because we actually stopped paying him like a couple years ago. So <laughs> he just kind of hangs around, and uh, he's got this red staple now. <laughs> uh, he's very convincing, you know. I, I, I know more about OSGI than I ever thought I should. Um, but. Uh, that just for the people that are listening, one of the ways that you can identify what those quick wins are in, in our issue tracker, uh, anytime you go to issues.lifeway.com and you go to the LPS project in particular, this will exist for other projects. We're, we're still proliferating it. But um, if you do a JQL search, which is under the search menu, and you, you go to the project and you search for on the field epic equals quick underscore win. Uh, all, all, all one word, so to speak. Can you uh, screen share label. and show us? Huh? Can you screen share and show oh, us? Oh, OK. You're making me show my skills. OK. <laughs> okay. okay. So um, let me give you a screen share. You can just share like one app. You don't have to share your chat window where you're making fun of us. OK. Can you see me now? We can see you, but not your screen. All right. Did you click screen share on the left? I did. And then you have to pick which screen to share and then hit start screen sharing. There we go. There you go. Yep. OK, so um, when you go into the issues in the global navigation, you can uh, search out issues. And then if you're in simple search, which is what most people, I think, do, um, the first thing that you need to do is select the project. These are all my internal projects. <sighs> the community will see the public. Avert ye gaze. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I didn't create my fake user account there. So once you select the, the portal um, community project, uh, 
you can go ahead and drill down on the story ticket type. And I'm just going to do a refresh search just because it gives me all of the custom fields that exist in that particular project. And then go on down here looking for the custom field epic theme. So quick, I can type win, execute, and then you'll see 32 stories uh, matching the that, that particular epic for uh, quick wins. So these are things that the developers just decided that they wanted to work on. And that they may be small, but that doesn't mean that we limit ourselves to just quick wins. Um, I think uh, one of the, the floodgates that have been opened has been um, obviously Marketplace. I don't know how many um, people, I'm going to stop sharing my screen because I think um, I'm, I'm more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Just click on screen share on the left, there you go. All right, there we go. Um, so uh, with Marketplace, right, how, how many people have been up there and looked at the, the applications that have been published that are called uh, LifeRay Labs or something that says it's, it's an application that's written by a LifeRay staff member but not something supported by LifeRay. It's not official. Um, so we allow, I mean we're, we're a community uh, project and our staff members and our, our uh, community members, they're, they're one and the same in a lot of ways. So we want our, our staff to feel just as empowered um, as anyone else to come up with an app that works. Absolutely. That's what they want. So um, if, if I were a developer, uh, I would be developing an org chart application right now. <laughs> <laughs> hint, hint, anyone listening? <laughs> Have you filed this in the ideation? I portal? did. I did. This is LPS 13530. And oh, it's called an chart, Charting Dash Reports 2. And um, which I thought was interesting because there's actually a message board from a community member that was talking about this would seem like it would be a no-brainer for LifeRay to do and and the no-brainer over here uh, did actually want to do it at one point in time but you know we have a lot of ideas and I think the best way that we're going to, to get them done is by uh, using ideation and collaborating with the community um, in order uh, to develop these out so so that's the a second way that I think that we that we balance things is by allowing our, our staff members to develop marketplace apps. Um, they can do that on their free time. Obviously, um, we encourage a certain amount of that during the workday if it's a really good idea. And, they, and they'll and they talk to their team lead maybe or, or Brian Chan here in the office and say, hey, you know, can I spend some time on this? Um, so that's, that's kind of on a TBD basis. And, so, and then last Last but yeah. not least, uh, for innovation, um, I, we dog food. We are using, as I said, uh, social office on our in internet and uh, on liferay.com. We have several communities, not only the guest community. And so from our IS team, which you'll be hearing from uh, Ron, I believe, after me, yep. shortly thereafter, and uh, they. Uh, are regularly doing internal projects and projects for marketing that generate these kind of features. And so they'll actually, just like any kind of professional services department, be contracted, so to speak, from the dog booter, like such as myself, or say our marketing team or our training team, and, and then they'll they'll come up with these um, features on the website that may or may not get incorporated back into the product depending on whether it's just specific to us. I see. Um, so, so speaking of ideation, um, you, I, you mentioned you were thinking about having some of your team come around and give some ideas. Are you still planning on doing that? Well, I did ask everyone to kind of think of an idea that, that they would like. I, I, I have uh, three of my team members with me. And now um, are these team members going to file these ideas on our ideation? <laughs> I sure hope so, um, <laughs> but uh, I, I think we, we have, uh, I'll just go in and order. I have people uh, sitting around the table with me from my team. I'm going to let them have my seat. Um, first and foremost is someone that 
I think the community has had a little uh, more interaction with lately than even myself. Um, this is Edward Gonzalez, and he is one of the project managers on the in the PMO team. He's been with the company for I guess around eight, nine months. Yeah, close to a year. Close eight. to a year. Wow. Okay. And so Edward's been helping out with uh, getting some of our community contributions through um, from bug fixes to ideation. So I wanted to give him my seat. Um, move over and let him introduce himself. Hey, James. Hey, Edward. Hey, guys. <laughs> well, Good. Look, do, I need, do I need to comb my hair? No. Uh, yeah, you, and your name is still Cynthia. <laughs> oh, I, you know what? I did not change that. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> wow, where, where are you, James? Where is that? Uh, I am in, I, I'm at home. Uh, oh. I just put a screen behind me, and I'm projecting. Here we go. <laughs> now we're at the Shibuya Crossing in, in Tokyo. Wow, you have a studio next to the street. It's a Google... <laughs> <laughs> that's great, that's great. Yeah, this is my view now. <laughs> awesome. Well, yeah. like uh, Cynthia said, um, I am the Community con uh, Contributions Manager, and I've been uh, interfacing with the community with you guys uh, now for the past few months, and uh, you guys, I don't know if you guys remember me, but I'm the guy with the tilted head uh, <laughs> that makes comments on bugs and uh, feature requests. So. I don't want to talk like this the rest of the uh, <laughs> presentation, but if it helps you to know who I am, then I'm, I'm willing to do it. So, but I don't think anyone wants that. So no. I'll stay in this position. Okay, great, cool. Okay, so um, how do we? What do I do? And um, and how can I help you? Or how can I be of service? Right. Um, as a community contrib uh, contributions manager, I um, I make sure that whatever you report and has a contributions uh, included in the issue or bug um, or even feature requests, I make sure the right people get get the um, uh, this bug uh, or this feature request. So in other words, I look for that developer who is perfect for that for that bug for that component. So that's an overall scope of what I do, right? Uh, now, before I get to the developer, I need to, uh, I need help, right? I need the develop, I need the uh, reporter, right? You community member, I need you to help me with um, with a few things, and one of them is uh, make sure that uh, you have the accurate component, right? We have a number of components that we included, so we can make your issue um, be addressed right away and uh, have. A developer just write for it, so we have we have that as an option, uh, and actually it's a requirement in the component. Second thing is having a um, an accurate um, affected version. Uh, so you want to have the latest. You want to test a bug against the latest, um, say for example, a release, right? You have uh, currently we have milestone four, um, and hopefully in the future we will have milestone. Four. Why? Right, that's coming up. It's in the works. Community, you guys are the first to know. So, what's the date on that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you have it. Soonish. <laughs> you have it. Copy there. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, I do have that. Yeah, you have it. I don't know where it is. It's somewhere okay. in here. Where it's the heck is it? There. Grimshaw. There we go. I use this with my. I used to use this with my with my wife. When we were dating. Yeah, there you go. You got it. Yeah. Nice. Okay, so um, we also have, um, so those are two things, so components, we need that as a requirement, have an accurate component in that bug you report and the feature request that you report, or, um, and then the second thing is the affected version, you have to test that bug against the latest uh, release, right? Yep. And for feature requests, um, just make sure that that request is not a duplicate. Same thing for the bug, make sure that you, we have no duplicates at all. Yeah, Suggestimate is an awesome plugin. Okay. Yep. Exactly. Suggestimate. Right. Very easy. Do a search or type in create a ticket. Type in keywords. Bam. You will get your uh, um, some clues of whether you have a duplicate or not. So I got to cut you off, Edward, because we got ten more minutes for uh, for this session. I know you guys have more people. Uh, but yeah. one thing I wanted to add is that. Uh, we treat con contributions like gold uh, and like a gift from above. Uh, yes. 
I know that it doesn't look or hasn't looked like that in the past because uh, we have, um, you know, we've sort of essentially uh, grown to the point where we, we can't process all of them and so it looks like we might be ignoring you. But uh, this is one of the reasons why Edward was brought on to, uh, to help in this process. Um, so just keep in mind we're not, we don't, we, we value contributions heavily because we're, like I said at the beginning, we're a very small company. We rely on our community a lot. So thank you for the work that you do, Edward. Thank you, guys, and thank you, guys, thank you, contributors. You guys make life rate much better when you report and contribute to us. So we thank you, guys, for saving us so much time and effort. So we appreciate you guys. And James, great job. Oh, thanks. Thank you. No, thanks for you for coming. So who's next? Okay. It's the wall. Yeah. <laughs> right now I'm bringing to you the project manager for our Market Live uh, part of the website, the Market Live project, and also our release uh, project manager for our releases, um, Paul Chung. You can have a All right. And um, I asked uh, Paul to kind of share something that we use in the PMO office, um, and I'll let you give credit and I'll let you explain, uh, to train our, our engineering team and staff on some of the uh, principles behind how we get things done. Right. Uh, thank you. Um, so, uh, as Cynthia mentioned, uh, my name is Paul Chung. I um, am a project manager for the Marketplace. And one of the things that uh, the PMO actually was trying to utilize was um, a software development and project management system called Lead. Um, and it is actually something that I was introduced to while I was studying with uh, for it. And I actually um, connected with Ed Gonzalez, and we um, used. <laughs> I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, Paul is much taller than I am, so his head oh was cut off. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what is that noise? Yeah. So, um, we yeah. So we use this uh, project management uh, methodology called Lead, um, and as the name suggests, it, it really is about maximizing uh, efficiency and productivity, and to minimize um, uh, waste as much as possible. I mean, waste can be really spread out amongst a lot of different things. It, it can be something from like uh, slow communication or uh, you Know, unnecessary coding, and it can be something as far stretching as the ergonomic comfort of uh, developers' fingers as they type on their keyboard. So, I mean, <laughs> we, we it really has to encompass a, a large um, span of things. And as we actually thought about how we're going to teach our developers worldwide um, how we're going to actually lead them with this sort of project management, we used a game called the Lean Lego game. Um, it was created by uh, a Brazi Brazilian man called Danilo Seto, I believe. And um, it is actually an incredibly informative and incredibly uh, fun and interactive game. Uh, I actually have a few of the pieces that we actually used. Um, uh, they're different colors, and basically it, it's, it's really getting them in the motion of how these sort of um, processes actually work. And it's really guiding them through uh, the process. And we, we brought them through three particular processes. One was called the push system, the other was called the pull system, and the last one was called, called the cross-functional uh, system. And each of them kind of showed in its way um, some of the difficulties that may come, some of the pitfalls and the, and the flaws within the system. And uh, one of the big things that we were trying to teach them was uh, a Japanese word called kaizen, um, and it means continuous improvement. And it's something that we were definitely trying to stress, where developers and project managers were uh, becoming very keen and becoming very um, uh, insightful into how our processes actually work and whether or not there are sections of our processes where we can make it and streamline it even more. And it is something that we definitely uh, uh, strive um, strive to do. And um, actually, I was one of these pieces actually, um, they were actually created by one of the people in our project management office. And it, it's sort of complex, but at the same time, it, it's pretty simple. It's about five layers. And basically, 
uh, each team will have to try to construct this. Um, it's basically this little house, I guess you can say. Um, and it was really fun to watch them kind of fumble around, and a bunch of engineers who are definitely much more knowledgeable than you know um, constructing Legos, and just seeing them uh, working through these different processes uh, was uh, really, uh, I think that they learned a lot from it, and a, and a lot about why we instate certain things, and why we push for certain uh, methodologies uh, here in the project. You know. Nice. And yeah, um, I don't know if you guys actually want to see me try to construct one of these together. I think it's pretty cool. Um, it, it was interesting, though, explaining to our bosses why half the PMO team was playing with Legos for yep. two at their desks. Yeah, I think Edward and I were the only people alive for ever to be paid. For them. So, um, That's awesome. Here. You got five minutes. Hmm? You got five minutes. So if you have time, if you want to do Legos, go for it. All right, sounds good. Give them 30 seconds and time of the clock. <laughs> Wait, <come. laughs> All right. On your mark. All right, can you guys see? Go. All right. <laughs> go, go, go. Build that house. Build that house. Raise the roof. Raise the roof. Raise the roof. Raise the roof. Hi, <laughs> right, guys. Oh no! Yeah, yeah backup builders. Waste, waste, <laughs> waste! <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I think. <laughs> you know, it's as simple as that. So, um, thank you guys, um, and yeah, we we hope to continue to improve our processes here at Lightbrake and the way that we uh, manage uh, our projects. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. James, did you want to ask any questions of, of Paul about Marketplace or, or Um, hmm. I, uh, do you have anyone else? I do. I have Caleb. Yeah. So let's get Caleb on. Um, we're going to be talking to, with Petra later uh, right. tomorrow, actually. So we will uh, pepper her with the Marketplace questions. Okay, good. <laughs> That's one thing. Uh, that's one thing about the. I, I'm going to sit real quick. That's one thing about the PMO is is that um, so many of the things that we do, uh, so many of the, the projects are. You know, they have product owners and they have teams that can speak to the very specific things about it. So I thought one of the things that might be inter interesting to the community and and why I volunteered to be a part of this is not only to help everyone understand how how LifeRay does what we do. But also because when I was uh, speaking at the symposium this year, I had a lot of people curious to know um, how were we using LifeRay and the other open source tools to so that they could uh, replicate or mirror what we're doing. Um, right. how, do, how are we setting up our wikis to track different requirements? How are we integrating with Jira and GitHub and those kind of things? Because a lot of our ISVs for Marketplace, a lot of our community members and, and partners are, are also using the same exact tools that, that we are because we, we love open source <laughs> products. Nice, nice. So um, speaking of that, so, some of the tools that, that we use are employed by our business analysts. And in the PMO office, we have um, one of our uh, lead business analysts, Caleb Fong, with us, who um, has been at LifeRay for over a year and a half now? Two years. Wow. I'm just really off. I'm in a time war. <laughs> um, and Caleb spent um, his first year and a half at, at, at LifeRay in the support team. So he has a, a really sh uh, strong foundation in, in the kind of things that our customers and community experience in the product. And so he was a real uh, good person to bring over as, as a business analyst um, with that understanding so we can make improvements in our requirements. So he's going to uh, come here and, and just talk a little bit about his job, what he does. Awesome. Hey, Caleb. Hi. Hi, everybody. So tell us what you do. So as a business analyst, uh, there's a lot of things that need to be done. And the biggest thing that uh, we, want, we want to do is hear what the stakeholders, what you have to say, what, what your needs are in a product or the business. And to give you an example, 
uh, when we did the liferay.com, trying to redesign the website, we met with all the different stakeholders that basically have a say in, in the website and how they use it. That includes executive teams, that includes the common user, just people browsing. That includes our customers too. We met with a few of our customers, got some feedback from them, and a few of our partners too. So we really value the things that uh, people need in our products and our processes. And as a business analyst, we, we meet with them personally just to, to hear from them. We take that information and we post that information using social office so that people can see these are what people need. And so we use our own tools to take the information that we get from, from all the stakeholders and we consolidate it there. So uh, once, that, once we get the information from our stakeholders, then we proceed with, okay, uh, according to the business needs, how are we going to proceed forward? Uh, we use tools to either do some type of mock-up, such as Balsamic, uh, which is now a Jira plugin. So we can we can mock up kind of the things that, you know, what we want to present to the, the stakeholders, and this is what you wanted, and this is a this is what we came up with. So I mean, that's basically what we do uh, in a nutshell. Um, we also take those the things that they've been to the stakeholders and turn them into requirements, uh, either functional requirements or user stories. And we post those into JIRA as tickets that our design team and our QA team can then follow to build and uh, design the product that... And release to the masses. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no. So, yeah. so I, I don't know if everyone is aware of the Balsamic plugin. Oh, yeah, you know what? Uh, we are not. And I know you, you mentioned it to me, and I think it sounds really awesome, and it's really good for our ideation engine as well. Um, do you want us to, to, to show you? I do, you but I, I, I think we're running a bit over time, and I don't want to, like, we have a big team from, uh, from Savoir Fair Linux at 2.30, so I want to get to Ron and team before, because they look like they are got something even more interesting. Okay. So, so uh, yeah. So, Caleb, uh, thanks a lot for for joining. Um, sure. Thank you for having me. I and I think we should definitely do something, Cynthia, with Balsamic, um, and maybe Caleb, you can help out um, because it's basically a really good way for us, for you as a community member, to uh, give us your ideas, not only in text but in you know in diagrams. And uh, it's it's you know pictures worth a thousand words. Yeah, most definitely. I'd love to be part of that. Okay. Just a quick, quickly to access it, just pretty much from a ticket, click on the More Actions menu, and there's Add Mockup, Edit Mockup, and from there, ah. you start from scratch or edit one that you've already done. Okay, awesome. Very right, good. Thank so thank you very much. Um, and Cynthia, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna jump over to Ron because I think he's like right down the hall from you, and he's got something very interesting for our uh, for our viewers. Okay. Well, thank you. So. Thank you, Cynthia. Uh, yeah. We'll see you around, and I'm sure you'll see Cynthia online or her name in a uh, RSS feed near you. So, okay. So, uh, yeah. So, Ron, I see uh, we can see you guys. And are you there, Ron? Yeah. Can you hear us? Yeah, we can hear you. Cool. So oh, go ahead and, yeah, we're, uh, they're all doing good. I'm collectively speaking for everybody. <laughs> Okay. Actually, uh, no, no, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so we, I'm, uh, we're the web team for LifeBear.com, or we're part of the web team. This is actually the front end side, uh, and we work in the LA office. And then we have a couple uh, remote folks who do the back end, and they're in other parts of the U.S. Uh, but just briefly, I'm Ron. You may have seen my blog. Uh, uh, like the people who use LifeRay, and then also even starting your blog about um, things at the front end. And people. your last name is pronounced? Sara Uday, but I accept all pronunciations. So, uh, <laughs> as long as you try, you get points. All right. And, uh, um, uh, you know, Chu. I'm Ryan Schuler. And I'm Nate Cook. And uh, if, you, if anyone has any questions at any time, feel free to... Uh, Put them in, I guess, the IRC chat. Yeah, I'll watch the IRC chat and the uh, Google chat. Okay, cool. Uh, so I don't know. We we're having a hard time figuring out what we wanted to talk about. It's that's always a great way to start a presentation. Uh, so we figured we could talk about um, things that we're working on now. And one of the big ones that's consuming a lot of our time and our hair is uh, the LifeRay.com refresh. And uh, we're working on upgrading 
uh, or not upgrading, but refreshing the, the look and feel and the content. Uh, and I think originally we were going to do it all in one. We were hoping to do it all in one swoop uh, with the, the content and the theming and even some cool new functionality. But um, we realized that it would actually be better if we did it more iteratively, uh, little by little. And we're actually going to start with the theme, uh, which is actually close to, to done right now. And um, we were thinking we, we'd love to show you guys a little of the new theme, if you're interested. I don't... I don't Tell us if you know. Absolutely. No, no, no. <laughs> you, uh, we would love to see that. Okay. We are strong. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So ignore the content, um, but our, our strategy was to, uh, the home page is going to change completely, and we're just playing around with different uh, UI uh, and content right now, um, things that we can do to make the, everything kind of pop more and more interactive. Uh, but the idea is to uh, create a new theme that uh, will fit right on top of the old theme, uh, but give kind of a, a fresher feel to it, and that will we'll, uh, iterate on it over time, little by little. But you can see that this is the overview page. Uh, the theme actually got a lot simpler, a lot lighter, and that was kind of on request from, from marketing and the higher-ups. Right, we got to figure out who the, yeah, we got to figure out who's uh, feedbacking. we got to start muting people. Oh, uh, yeah, so, I mean, I get, I'll just flip through a few of these pages and you can we're still working on the content, so some of it still looks kind of broken and whack. Uh, but we're hoping that um, <laughs> somebody's watching the broadcast in a different window somewhere. Okay. Oh, cool. This works. Uh, and then some of the major things we were going to change is uh, we're as you can see on the well. This will be the home page, but on the home page, that there actually is. We're kind of reducing the, the main nav. Uh, I think before the site used to be a place where, uh, kind of like if you're a developer, a business user, a brand new user, or a, you know, a life rate partner, a customer, whoever, uh, liferate.com was kind of like the one hub that was trying to serve everyone all at once, which is why um, we actually had a lot of complaints about people who come to the website and they actually don't even know what we do or what we're for. Uh, things like that. So we're hoping to streamline things a little more. Uh, the home page will be a little more new user oriented um, and much cleaner content, simpler. And then we're thinking on the top right, uh, we'll have things, I don't know if you can see it, but on top right there's dev resources, marketplace, there's a link for community, uh, training, events, um, and then we have this cool sign-in pop-up. So I can see it, but I don't. I, I think the viewers might have the trouble just because it's little. Can you make the font bigger, or is that going to screw up stuff? Yeah, we can make it bigger. There you go. But yeah, the, I mean, the general idea is that we're going to put all the kind of like this for all of the return visitors to our site. You don't have to fish through the content. You'll just find the links you need on the very top or uh, on the very bottom in the footer. Um, so I think that'll be a little, a little more intuitive, uh, a little quicker, uh, and then that way, uh, when we tell people that we know that we work for, when we tell people we work for Lifeway, we can send them to our website and they'll actually figure out like what we do. Awesome! That looks really good so far. Yeah. So, uh, so that the the million dollar question when? Yes. That is a very good question. And, uh, <laughs> oh, look at the time. you got to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see you guys later. So that was all we had. Here you go. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you couldn't make out what you said there. But anyway, we're going to keep going. Uh, the, yeah, you can see here's the, the new touched-up community. But yeah, we, uh, we're hoping by the end of this month, uh, if not just the very beginning of May, we're going to roll out kind of a do or die. We're going to roll the theme out. And uh, if possible, we're going to have new, brand new home page content. But if that's not ready yet, then that's OK. We'll roll that out a little later. But as you can see, the theme is, is pretty much there. Um, we, haven't, we haven't changed a whole lot, just mostly in the way that you navigate through the site. But you can see that we've, uh, on a lot of pages, we've removed the, 
a left nav. So yeah, that way yeah, there's yeah. actually more more room for content. That's cool. Uh, but we'll, we don't, we're still going through the community making sure that everything works. We don't want people to run into dead ends on the site and stuff. Yeah, that's good. Like sometimes I run into uh, screen real estate limitations on LifeRay.com, like horizontal. Yeah, we 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 feel you, James. We've seen, <laughs> we've seen the home page, uh, the community landing page. So yeah, <laughs> you can't put hey, any now. more ads in the left here. We're trying. I didn't put those ads there, by the way. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I will. Re- the person who's responsible for those shall remain nameless, but it wasn't me. I can name them if you want. <laughs> <laughs> You probably helped put them there. Uh, let's see. Are we ending at forty or? Yeah, we're 30? ending at ten minutes because I want to. I don't want to, the guys from Savoir Fair to have to wait because they um, they are special. Okay. Not that you guys aren't, but they're special okay. in that they have a time limitation. We understand. It's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, how do I? I need to get rid of the screen share. Just click screen share again on the left. Let's try to just toggle it off. Oh, got it. Okay. Zoomed out. There you are. So this is us. So I saw a guitar earlier. What was that all about? Oh, I don't know. You saw a guitar? <laughs> what? What? We're not a music company. We're <laughs> here. We're serious. We have serious work to do. <laughs> yes, of course. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, so that we've been working on the library.com refresh. We've also been work really busy with the symposium uh, pages, or the new symposium site, because we have uh, them going throughout the year. Uh, so we have uh, a new theme and a new look and feel for that. If the designs come up with some really cool stuff there, uh, if you are attending the symposiums, and then, then uh, you'll see all the you'll be surrounded by all the new swag and all the fun stuff. And I think. Uh, Along with swag, uh, marketing through the shirts at us a few minutes before we came on. But it, I don't know if you can read it, but it says "Make Apps Life Free Marketplace," um, and there's I think there's an app uh, contest going on right now. Oh, really? I didn't, I hadn't heard of that. You didn't know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know. It's an app contest, so you uh, so you build apps and you win stuff like iPad Minis and uh, trips. Paid for trips anywhere in the world with an asterisk. The asterisk is it has to be a life rate conference. Yeah. So shameless plug. Yeah, exactly. You guys are full of shameless plugs today. That's awesome. Yeah, <laughs> we're full of. <laughs> but we're gonna have a in the next. Uh, let's see, one, two, three, four. In the next three hours, we're gonna be all non life rate people. So. Oh. Great. So we had a bunch of life rate people this morning, um, and only one non life rate guy. So. We're going to move into a new phase. So, all right, that's. It'll be nice to hear from some of the community. Yeah, yeah. What do you um, mean? So I have another question for you. Um, okay. <laughs> so you know, you guys are the web team, and you 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 build awesome web sites. Do you ever influence the direction of the product itself, like LifeRay itself? Like, do you ever work on that stuff? Uh, there's been a lot of, uh, like, you guys just saw Cynthia in the PM office uh, just earlier, and there's a lot of initiative to start getting feedback from our team and what we've been doing. Actually, not less than a couple years ago, the whole web team used to be just Enoch, uh, and and I think Amos, our back-end guy, and we've actually grown a lot uh, in the past year and a half, but uh, now they're starting to see us as a real force here at the company. <laughs> and, um, force and to be so, reckoned with. Yeah. Uh, so no, we. In, in other words, we've had absolutely no influence on what happens with the product, but we'd love <laughs> to have more influence. Um, I, I think they do take some of the things that we say, like uh, some of the um, people in charge of product they actually interviewed us uh, late last year to talk about uh, staging and to talk about using Kaleo workflow and some of the things that we could leverage to um, solve our problems here in the office. Uh, and then also they, you know, watch us actually use the product. Uh, yeah, because you're essentially forced to use LifeRay to build yeah. a real world website. So what better place to get feedback than that? Yeah, exactly. And we're like right here, you know, uh, in the LA office, so available for feedback at any time. 
uh, yeah, so I think, uh, yeah, we, so we haven't had a lot of uh, influence on it, but then the product management team is, they're starting a new thing where once a month we're going to give feedback. So we do have our web team blog, or the blog that's under my name, you can always comment on that, and you know, we can be a microphone along with, you know, games and the rest of the community. Um, so that awesome. was, let's see. We have a little bit of time. You have five uh, minutes. Were there any other questions out there? Otherwise, we were thinking of maybe just talking about what a day at Library looks like. Uh, I do not see any other questions. So go for it. All right. So what is a day of Library like? A day at Library? Uh, we hear that there's a or there's a game room that's going to be built or that's being finished up uh, across the hallway. And uh, that includes ski ball. I think there's a bar or something. But <laughs> really? These people. I mean, the rumors keep getting more and more grand about this place. This magic. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but hopefully it finishes soon and we can confirm uh, those rumors. Confirm or deny. That'll be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then James, you can move over here to the LA office. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it'll just like that, real easy. <laughs> uh, it's just a one button, just like the cat, uh, the uh, yeah, applause button. Yeah, yeah. Um, we well, also have a uh, mandatory wear the same shirt every day. So. <laughs> yeah, whatever marketing <laughs> um, gives us. Okay. Yeah, sure. sometimes it's a shirt that's just like a monkey on it, and I don't know why, and they just call us monkeys all the time. <laughs> sometimes it's degrading, but. <laughs> I'm sure they're kind-hearted about it. <laughs> yeah. Nice. <laughs> we have a soda fountain. Uh, I saw that earlier this morning in the coffee machine. Uh, coffee machine thing. Did anyone get like a tour of the office yet? Uh, not yet. We, I mean, we kind of saw the kitchen, but that was pretty much it. And the wall, the the blue wall. Oh, we did the blue wall. Uh, that was um, uh, Zeno or Marcellus. Oh, because okay. they were here. They they actually so uh, Eduardo was on it. Oh, what time was he on? Six thirty a.m. California time, and he went to the office and it was locked and closed. So he was sitting in his car doing a webcast. <laughs> so, and at seven a.m., I guess I don't know who showed up and unlocked the door, and uh, so Zeno was able to do it from inside. So that was cool. That's it's a day at life, Ray. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Getting locked out of the... Sometimes you get in, sometimes you don't. You know? Yeah, we don't have badges. We don't need no stinking badges. Yeah. So You're not controlled by the man. There's no swiping necessary to get in. So yeah, we got um, three more minutes. Three? Uh, well, we, we can switch over to Sven now if you guys are done. I don't see oh, any no, questions. We're, I don't, uh, we actually have a little, uh, a little something that, that we thought... We have uh, a little, another message... Oh. Uh, oh, really? Uh, just, just give us a, a little second here. OK. Awesome. <laughs> uh, there's no guitar here. Uh, can you guys hear me? Can you hear me OK? Up there? Yep. Sounds good. Uh, so we thought we'd write, you know, some completely original songs about Life Ray. These are things that we sing in the office pretty much every day. Uh, it really gets us going <laughs> in the morning, uh, wakes us up, gives us energy. Uh, so I hope these songs will be, you know, songs of the heart for you as well. I've got sunshine on a cloudy day.
Thanks a lot. That's that's that was fun. That and, def, and yes, one that was recorded. So uh, that will definitely make the highlight reel. Oh, great. <laughs> All right, thanks, James. All right, thanks, Ron, and the rest of the web team. You guys are, are awesome. Set? Are they there? Are they ready? Oh yeah, we are. Uh, we're ready to we're ready to roll with uh, Sven and the, some of our fair Linux guys. So Sven. Yes. Sir. Bonjour. <laughs> Bonjour, James. <laughs> How are you doing? Good. I hope. Uh, I, I'm sorry you have to follow that. <laughs> I was not expecting that. <laughs> no, no. I, I must uh, be clear from the beginning. We are not going to sing anything. <laughs> what? Because <laughs> we are just uh, IT people. Why not? <laughs> well, yeah. Every session beforehand was a song, so you kind of have to now. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a very bad singer, and uh, I'm, I'm just checking uh, all the, the people that are uh, joining me uh, here uh, in, the, in the room, and uh, I'm not sure they want to sing anything. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's okay. You don't have to sing. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so welcome. Uh, why don't you um, go ahead and introduce yourself and uh, the rest of the team and um, what you guys are doing. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, is the sound and the video uh, clear? Is this yeah, it's extremely clear, clear and awesome. Okay. So. Okay, excellent. Uh, well, I'm I'm very happy to be able to uh, to have the opportunity to join that uh, that uh, one day library. Uh, I I I was listening to uh, and and looking at the video uh, this morning. I I learned a lot about Hello UI and uh, JSF, and uh, it's it's really great. Um, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is uh, Sven Berlin. Um, I'm uh, the vice president of the department Enterprise Solutions. Uh, for a company uh, called uh, Sourfare Linux, uh, based in Canada, in Montreal. So we are mainly uh, French speakers, uh, but uh, we are, of course, in Canada. Well, not not in that room. We have a, <laughs> a lot of our developers are are also English uh, native speakers. Uh, so I, I'm going to uh, quickly uh, go <laughs> and and show the team. Uh, I have uh, here seven uh, Julien. Uh, we have uh, Marat, Dimitri, uh, Julien, and uh, from uh, our uh, su support and infrastructure team here, we have uh, uh, Marcos. And uh, while well, you can see our office uh, behind me, uh, I I'm not sure if you can uh, see uh, that much, but uh, well, I, I cannot move the computer. Uh, uh, that I would so call that the, uh, the fishbowl. The like what? Fish, uh, fishbowl, like because you got all the glass, and so you're all sitting inside of a fishbowl. 
Oh yeah, yeah. Well, it's the training room actually. <laughs> no, it's not a football. <laughs> There's no water in it. <laughs> no, not yet. <laughs> uh, yeah. What about us? Well, we are the company is is really uh, open source oriented. Uh, we uh, well in my department uh, we are mainly uh, doing uh, library development, uh, support, uh, training, and uh, uh, coaching on library. Um, and uh, but we uh, we have two other departments. Uh, one department dedicated to uh, uh, um, um, let's see, uh, embedded uh, Linux. So uh, Linux drivers um, like uh, kernel, kernel development, Android development, and we have a big uh, team about twenty people uh, uh, doing support. Uh, not only library, but uh, also like uh, Linux, uh, Red Hat, and uh, everything like. Uh, so, well, what I wanted to actually, I wanted to show you something uh, uh, today. Uh, it's a uh, it's a plugin we have developed uh, over the past uh, two years. So it took us a, a, a few weeks. Uh, we we couldn't contribute it to the marketplace yet because of some uh, restriction on uh, uh, the permission system, I think. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, we talked about that already. <laughs> yeah, but uh, it's available. Actually, it's it's open source. Uh, the source code is available uh, uh, on our uh, website, and um, and anyone can download it and uh, package it and, uh, and install it on uh, their awesome. Library. That's great. Six dot one, and as soon as the marketplace will be ready for uh, for for us to uh, to publish it, then I will do it. Of course, it's it's a mix. Actually, it's an integration of. Uh, I don't know if you know the, the uh, another great open source uh, product which is called Talent. It's an ETL uh, product that let actually build any kind of processes for uh, taking some data from a database from from a file or whatever and pushing that to to some other place. Could be email, could be Excel sheet, could be whatever uh, is is uh, uh, whatever uh, the people want. Um, and um, actually, what's very interesting is uh, uh, that uh, that product comes with a designer and uh, let you design a, a process. And uh, by using it on Liferay, you you can execute uh, uh, those processes uh, directly from Liferay, schedule it. So that's <clears throat> what I wanted to show you to uh, uh, for the for the next uh, 10, 15 minutes. Yeah, absolutely. That'd be great. And this okay. is all open source, you said. Uh, yeah, everything is open source. Yes, Talent is a uh, GPL. Uh, also, there's an open source version, and uh, our plugin is a uh, GPL, uh, and of course, Library is uh, open source. Nice. Uh, so I'm sharing the screen now. Look. Can you see the screen? Yep, I can. Okay, so I'm. Um, that's a. a, a, a a vanilla version of Liferay. Uh, I have not installed anything else than uh, than uh, the default package, uh, the Liferay bundle, and uh, our uh, plugin. And on uh, my other uh, screen, I have uh, that's the ETL, so the Talent ETL uh, project. So I I'm I'm here in a well. I'm going to deploy a very simple uh, process that just uh, generates uh, uh, 10 uh, first names randomly and print, prints it uh, into the console. Uh, so if I execute that, uh, that process, you can see it. Uh, well, the resolution is not that high. Uh, but you see it here, hello, uh, and all the first names, so the yep. 10 random first names. So <clears throat> that tool is extremely powerful. It has connectors to all the databases, uh, the Salesforce, uh, uh, CSV, Excel sheets, uh, uh, a lot of uh, connectors. And now I can I can export that job into a zip file. So that's part of uh, uh, Talent. And okay. If I go back to Liferay now, uh, the plugin uh, you, uh, I have installed is uh, appears here on the server. ETL processes, uh, so it's a very uh, simple uh, interface. Uh, we can add processes, we can schedule jobs, and we can see all the jobs that have been executed in the past. So the first thing I have to do is import the process I've just shown you before. It asks it. Prom 
prompt for uh, for that uh, for the zip file I've just generated before import. Now it appears here in the list of uh, processes uh, that have been imported into library, and uh, from the action button I can uh, execute that job or schedule it uh, using uh, the, uh, the, well, the embedded uh, scheduler of library. Uh, delete or edit that uh, that process. If I execute it, well, it will just tell me that it was successfully executed. Uh, I can see in the history tab that it was executed at uh, well, the, uh, the time is not correct. Uh, it was not uh, correctly configured for my server, but uh, you see the date, you see the status, uh, and if I click on it, I see a bit more details. What's interesting is the result. So what was printed in, into the console is actually kept, and I can look at it. So <clears throat> that example is probably not very interesting uh, in terms of uh, in terms of a business of what it uh, produced. Uh, I have another uh, very uh, simple example: a reporting process. Uh, you see, it reads actually from the library user database. Nice. That's exactly what I was going to ask. Then it, it is a mapping tool that will take some of the fields. You see, it's very convenient the way you can uh, you can manage that, and basically, it's it's it would be very useful for importing some things. So here, I'm taking the first name, the last name, uh, into my uh, output uh, flow, and uh, well, there's a, I'm just ignoring uh, some of the use, system users that have no first name, last name. Uh, and I'm taking also the well. The, the query also takes the um, uh, actually it's not group it's it's roles. So it, it takes all the users with their roles. Uh, so I will have multiple lines for for the same user of course. But Talent has a nice box that will normalize the uh, here actually it's it's group it's uh, roles. Uh, so it will take multiple lines and and put uh, merge them into one. And at the end, it it just writes an Excel sheet on the. Uh, so it's it's really Excel. It's not a CSV or it it can be. Uh, it's it's the property format uh, Excel uh, that uh, most of the customer are, are looking for. And uh, you just provide the name, and uh, you can even uh, write into different uh, sheets. Uh, so if I'm exporting that job, same way I. Uh, I did it before for for the hello world process. I can go back here into library, import that process. So I have now my report process here. I can run it. It says okay. And if I go into the history, uh, well, I see everything is fine. Well, now, of course, I have to go back to my system to see the file that was created. But of course, if it is executed on the server, you don't have access to that file directly, except if you have a FTP account or something like that. But you can easily, in Talent, configure it to send that file by email to somebody uh, uh, you want, like your customer or and you s you see now that that this is my uh, Excel sheet with the first name, last name, and well, that must be uh, roles. So you see, there is one test user that has an administrator role, power user, user, and uh, my user that uh, that is not administrator. Uh, I c I can uh, do a quick test by creating a new role. Uh, And I will assign that role to uh, to my user. So now, if I go back to my ETL process and run it again, and refresh my my file, I see uh, that that role is there. So it's very. Nice. In our case, it's it's very frequent that uh, we need to import some uh, some data. We well, 
most of the time uh, uh, customers are uh, looking for reporting uh, reports based on the on the data that is available in library and library has a lot of data including uh, what was the last time um, the the user was connected uh, the creation date uh, and so on and uh, th this data is not always available, uh, like the auditing uh, auditing uh, plugin that is available with the EE version uh, is nice, but it, it, there is no reporting uh, report uh, based on that. So it's very easy to uh, to generate uh, to design uh, a process with Talon and to schedule it. Uh, for example, here schedule job. You can say execute every week. And uh, okay, on on Sunday, and if your process includes a sending by email uh, box, then uh, your customer or your user administrator is going to uh, will will get a, a that report by email every Sunday. So I have a question for you. Uh, you mentioned the uh, the talent has connectors. Uh, like database connectors, which I think is what you used in that example. Yes. Uh, can you also write your own connectors? Like, for example, if I wanted to write a connector that uses the Liferay user API to get users out instead of a direct database? Yeah, that's that's uh, actually very interesting. Is uh, uh, because the, that process is ex executed on the Liferay server. It uh, within the the same context. It can actually call the API of Liferay, so you can import from, uh, let's say, an Excel sheet, and uh, call the uh, user service local. Uh, I don't remember. The add user. Yes, and add user. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we made fun of that earlier on the call. We made fun of that API because it's like fifteen thousand parameters to the add user. But well, yeah, yeah. It, yeah I'm not saying it's it's very easy. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> if you know uh, the the API very well, you can you can do it. So there is um, a connector that is called uh, T Java Row, and uh, that connector uh, where is it? If I put here on my process. Oh, that's awesome! Can connect both uh, boxes. And now you see here, there's a code, code sample, uh, output row, equal, well, in our case, it's input row that interests us. So I could call uh, this um, user service uh, dot add user and input row dot first name and so on. So I, I, could, I could execute that. It's, uh, it's a bit uh, complicated to test because you cannot test it from talent because you don't have the context, context and everything. But uh, if you know exactly uh, the, the interface uh, and the parameters you have to send. You can test it from the, uh, the uh, what's it called, the execution script executor. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. And for a uh, control panel. Uh, and and you, you could, technically, you could even develop your own connector uh, so that's uh, the very generic one, Java row. You can write any Java code there, uh, but you uh, you can also include the libraries, of course. You can have uh, you can include uh, some uh, uh, wrappers over the uh, library uh, libraries, such it's easier to use the service. Um, um, and but you you can write your own uh, connector, and it will appear in, into that list. So if you, if you, that would be a good uh, improvement. On the, yeah, definitely. the you know, plugin. Cool. Uh, so we have a little bit of uh, a game for you guys. I don't know if you if you have anything else you want to present, but uh, no, that that was a quick overview okay. of uh, what we have done uh, recently. Uh, the the good thing is uh, we as an open source company, all the projects we are working uh, on. Um, uh, we by default the license is GPL, so technically we can contribute a lot. So when the customer uh, uh, allows us, we try to uh, to 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 build a, or to to contribute a module. Uh, so um, so uh, we were very uh, uh, happy to uh, when when the marketplace was was finally released. Uh, because it gave us uh, the opportunity to uh, to to, pro to contribute uh, more modules, so uh, we we're working on that. <laughs> yeah, we uh, we can't wait to see the already released marketplace. Uh, I mean, th so there are apps there now, as you know, but um, there's some issues with uh, with 
Packle and with a couple of other things that prevent some apps from being able to be published. So we're working through those. Hopefully with the GA3 release, everything will be smooth sailing. Um, I want to ask you guys one more question. Um, so you're, you're pretty active in other open source communities as well. I was wondering if you could talk about, uh, compare LifeRay to, I don't know, Python, for example. Uh, well, that, yes. Um, uh, we, we are actually contributing on also on the other uh, communities, uh, mainly the kernel, Drupal as well. Uh, Life Ray, that's the, and Open ERP, that's the the most uh, yeah the uh, the biggest project we are contributing, and we also we do have also two projects that are open source. Uh, one is called SFL Phone, which is a soft phone that we are developing uh, and which runs on on Linux and Windows as well. I think. Uh, the I think uh, the Life Ray community is is really also. Because uh, because of you first uh, as a community <laughs> manager, yeah, uh, unnecessary, course. but uh, thank you. No, no, but really because you're organi organizing uh, events, you're uh, you're also uh, helping people to uh, to contribute to uh, to build teams. Uh, uh, this uh, the entire user group thing. Uh, uh, it's it's great actually. Uh, and and Lifery is supporting that, offering a place where people can uh, uh, write blog entries, um, and 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 also contribute on the product. Uh, that is a bit different on others. Uh, the community on Drupal is very uh, big, so there are probably a lot more contributions than on Lifery. Yeah, a lot more developers. Yeah, a lot more uh, developers as well. Well, it's it's also because. Um, well, PHP is a bit uh, uh, is a bit easier to uh, to use, and Lifery as a as a portal is uh, is is also heavier than uh, Drupal. Uh, but it's also the, the the disadvantage you will have on that is that you you have so many modules, and most of them are not maintained anymore. It's very difficult for a company to know which module to use because for one single feature. You will have ten or twenty different uh, existing modules. Uh, so on, yeah, that's that's the disadvantage of uh, such a big community. And in Lifeway, what I like is um, uh, I have the impression I I, I don't know exactly how Lifeway uh, is working, but as soon as one feature which was contributed is very interesting, Lifeway is taking that over. And integrating it uh, into into the core, so into the uh, library, and then supporting it, so it makes uh, it makes the product uh, more robust. Yeah, that's the benefit of the commercial open source. But uh, we don't do that for every single idea. In fact, that's one of the reasons why we have the uh, ideation dashboard, uh, because we can't think of any as many great ideas as you can, but we also don't have time or don't have the resources to implement every single great idea, even though we would really like to. So it's a good way to uh, to empower the rest of the community to not only generate ideas, but get ideas for implementation. So if somebody yeah. comes along and wants to make you know, a bunch of money or wants to just develop something uh, that they feel will be used a lot, so they can go look at the most highly rated idea and implement it. So, Yeah. Yeah, well, I think the, the 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 biggest step was this uh, marketplace that allows anyone to contribute, and uh, uh, because of course there are a lot of modules that might be local or yeah, uh, local specific. Yep. Uh, uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Right. Uh, we the are in a calling. meeting room, and uh, someone was calling in that meeting. Um, so yeah, that's that's really great. Uh, and um, and it's it's I must say it's very we, we are also uh, partners with other uh, uh, commercial uh, open source products and uh, I'm 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 very amazed uh, how uh, how uh, community dedicated uh, the library is and it's very uh, yeah it's more open source oriented than uh, some others. Yeah, it's funny because sometimes people say I mean like you know pure open source. People will say that we're not open source because we've got this enterprise edition and it's a conflict of interest. But uh, I think in Life Race case, um, you know, I know, well, I know, and it's but it's it's a constant uh, 
uh, chore to explain that um, you know we're not in it. We're not in it. And Brian Chan was on earlier. We're not in it to get bought. We don't have you know these grand visions of some huge awesome uh, uh, company that's going to be millions of or thousands of employees and so forth. So um, yeah, so that's that's what we're in it for. Is the, is is you know building something that is useful for a lot of people and can help people in other areas of life, not just I, I think know, building websites. Really, yeah, there's one thing that makes uh, the world difference is uh, the um, the fact that you can buy uh, Enterprise uh, Edition, well, there's this limited uh, uh, version that is uh, actually uh, very affordable. And uh, even if you have the support for one or two years, you can stop at any time and continue using that Enterprise Edition without having uh, the new patches and the new uh, features, of course. But that is very important for most of the customers we, uh, uh, we have. It's because if you have to, well, if by buying an Enterprise Edition, so if by uh, using the support, um, and you will be to, uh, how to say that, um, when you stop paying it, if you have to go back to the Community Edition uh, because of the, the restriction on the, on the, on the license, that would be uh, that would be very problematic uh, for uh, for for the end user for the customer. Yeah. Yep. Well, that's that's great actually. I I, I don't know any other uh, commercial open source uh, company that uh, that offers that. For oh, cool. Customer. I mean, yeah. That's that's we con I'm constantly saying you know if you can't afford it or you don't need enterprise edition, you can go into production with the community edition. Uh, it, it's it's production ready. When we release it, we assume it is production ready. So that might not always be the case in retrospect, but the point is is that we don't use we don't put CE out there as like a crappy version of EE and make you buy EE. So uh, okay, so let's move on. Um, so the idea with this game, Sven, is it's called Closest to the Pin, and Ray Auger, our resident Canadian developer, is going to be my assistant. And uh, so, Sven, you need to pick, you need to choose two of your team members to uh, to play this game. Uh, well, I'm not Canadian actually. If I'm from Switzerland, so if is it Canada, you better, Canada? It's Canadian. Canada? Yes, it is. Uh, well, I'm looking, <laughs> you know what? Canada is is not very uh, very good in uh, in open source. I mean, uh, open source is not very well. Uh, it's, it's not teach at school, so uh, actually all the people that are in my uh, in the room, uh, none of them are from Canada. We, we, can, <laughs> we can try. We have uh, people from Spain, from Kazakhstan, for from Russia, from uh, France. But I'm from Switzerland. Uh, b uh, well. Let's, as, as long as your game. Uh, so I think the good thing about this game is you don't have to be right. You just have to be close. Uh, okay. okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, two others. Two other members. Uh, just yeah, two total. You can be one of them if you wish. So it's a quiz game. I'm going to ask two people the same questions, and we're going to see who gets I closer. Think, that's good. If I don't have to be part of uh, of the game, that's good. Then I yeah. can involve others. I'm going to uh, to take uh, Marcos. <laughs> He's trying to leave the the room. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, who's uh, in Canada for uh, some? Long time. Uh, yeah, so whoever's been here the longest. <laughs> I uh, oh, I have Christoph here. Christoph. He he was looking uh, through the through the window. We need you, Christoph. There's a game uh, about Canada. You're the best, uh, you can join. So Christoph and, and who's the other player? Hi, hey, Christoph. Who, who's the other player? Ah, it's me. Hello, Marcos. It's there. Marcos. He's from Spain. Okay. Okay. So Marcos, you have to step out of the room for this really? game. You have to, and I'm okay. going to ask Christoph. Okay. Yeah, and then you can, we'll call him back in when we're done. Okay. So there is a streaming on my laptop if you want to hear. <laughs> okay. So Ray OJ, he's going to record your answers to these questions. He's Ray. Okay. Yeah. Hey, Ray is on there. Hey, Ray, can you hear everybody? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going. You're going to give two minutes to. Uh, uh, actually, you know what? We're going to um, give you three minutes because last time we did this, we ran out of time. So three minutes. So the idea is, I'm going to ask you a question, and if you know the answer or you want to guess, you can do the guess. Otherwise, you can pass, and then you can go on to the next question. Um, and the idea is, you can come back later to answer the questions that you've passed on. Okay, and. Each question, you don't have to be correct. You just have to be close. So, and they're all questions. The answers are all numbers. 
So you can imagine that uh, whoever is uh, gets the closest will win. So I'm gonna ha I have an online timer here. So just I'm gonna start ask asking you questions, and you can just tell me the answer or say pass. Are you ready, Christoph? Yes, ready. Okay, here we go. Question one: After the war of 1812 between the U.S. and Britain, the United States and Canada each saw its self-perceived victory as an important foundation of its growing nationhood. How many months did the conflict last? Uh, pass. You know Ice we're in here. We don't hockey. really mind about story. <laughs> with... Ice hockey first appeared in 1920 Olympic Games in Antwerp, where Canada took the gold medal. How many goals did Canada score throughout their three-game campaign? The three games campaign. Yeah, how many goals in those three games did they score? Total goals. 12. Ice fishing, ice fishing is a popular Canadian pastime. In 2013, Lake Simcoe hosted an ice fishing tournament. How far apart must each angler's drilled hole be? How far apart do the holes have to be? In feet. You know, in, in Canada, we are a civilized country. We, we use met metric system. <laughs> Okay, in the in meters. <laughs> Can you quickly repeat? The, uh, yeah, how far apart do the holes have to be in ice fishing during this competition? Half a meter. Okay. Beer is the most popular alcoholic beverage in Canada in terms of both volume and dollar value. How many liters did Canadians consume in 2010? No. Total liters across the entire country. 70. Did you say 70? I, I, I would guess 70. 70 what? The people in Sudbury drink very much more than in, here in Quebec. A total number of liters across the entire country. A uh, total number, okay, not per uh, person? No, no, no. Oh. Uh, 33 million. Plus. Yeah, multiply by 7. For a year? Yeah. 3 litres par 100 million. 1 milliard. 1 billion. The Canadian progressive rock band Rush will be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame this year. How many fans attended their largest concert in Brazil in 2003? No, we pass. But we recommend you that you listen to Rocket Fire, which is a very famous Canadian Montreal band. <laughs> Curling is a sport in which players... Oh, time's up. Okay. All right. You know curling is playing in Newfoundland. <laughs> we play hockey. <laughs> I had questions about hockey, curling, baseball, and uh, uh, it, 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 oh my god, lacrosse. Very tough questions. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, you got to guess. You can't just. You know, that's the problem. Canada is a some so big country that. So what's up? What do you have to do? So I'm going to ask you, uh, you can stay, Christoph, as well. Uh, I'm going to ask you questions, and you tell me the answer. Uh, you don't have to be right. You just have to be close. So. I need to get closer. Okay, let's go. Are you ready? Yeah. OK. Question one. After the War of 1812 between the US and Britain, the United States and Canada saw its self-perceived victory as an important foundation for its growing nationhood. How many months did this conflict last? Uh, I don't know. Five? Ice hockey first appeared in the 1920 Olympic Games in Antwerp where Canada took the gold medal. How many goals did Canada score throughout the three-game campaign? Two. Ice fishing is a popular Canadian pastime. In 2013, Lake Simcoe held an ice fishing tournament. How far apart in meters must each angler's drilled hole be? Oh my god, in meters. I don't know, 20? Beer is the most popular alcoholic beverage in Canada in terms of both volume and dollar value. How many liters did Canadians consume in 2010? 
total yeah. across the whole country. Ah, in, tot in total? Yes. Uh, One billion? <laughs> the Canadian progressive rock band Rush will be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame this year. How many fans attended their largest concert in Sao Paulo, Brazil in 2003? A quarter million. Lacrosse is popular across all of Canada. In what year was lacrosse declared the National Game of Canada? Uh, in the 1960. The music of Canada has reflected the diverse influences that have shaped the country. In what year did Neil Young's album Harvest Moon win its first Juno Award for Album of the Year? <laughs> Marcos, 2000, 2000, 2000. I didn't he, was, he was not born. Okay, 19, <laughs> 1970. Curling is a sport in which players slide stones across a sheet of ice towards a target area. The 2002 Canadian film Men with Brooms centers on this sport. What percentage of the film's gross originated in Canada? Like, how much money did the film make in Canada, uh, percentage-wise? 80. 80 percent. Baseball has a long history in Canada where it's one of the most popular sports. In 1969, the Montreal Expos began playing in Jari Park Stadium. What is the capacity of this stadium? Um, 15,000. Hockey Night in Canada has began transmitting Saturday night hockey games of the Toronto Maple Leafs beginning in November 1931 via radio. Yes. Approximately how many listeners tuned in to the first broadcast? One million. All right. That's it. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, Jens, 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 you, should, you should prepare for the next one some questions especially for Quebec. <laughs> really? Yeah. Is, is Quebec a separate country? Oh. <laughs> it, that's what they want. <laughs> we won't answer that question. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to claim American ignorance. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Uh, so, Ray, do you have the answers? I mean, do you I have do. the. Uh, did you record them? Okay. So, the first question between uh, how long did the War of 1812 last? Uh, Let's see, who, what was, who, Christoph, who was the, the guy playing? Yeah, uh, Christoph, um, yes. who is the other gentleman here? We forgot He's his Marcos. name. Marcos. Marcos, okay. So, uh, so, uh, let's Marcos see. Marcos said so, five. Marcos said five, Christoph, Christoph passed. said so pass. So the, <laughs> so the answer is 32. Ooh. So Marcos wins. The next game, uh, question was, the, I found this one actually really surprising. The number of goals scored by Canada in the 1920 Olympic Games in three games. So Marcos said... Two, and, and Christoph said 12. answer was 29. So uh, Christoph wins that one. Yeah, it was crazy. One of the games was like 25 to 0. It was like, I didn't think that was possible in hockey. Come on. <laughs> uh, the next question is about the uh, ice fishing holes. So uh, Marcos said... 20 meters? <laughs> and Christoph said? Half a meter. Answer is 30 mm, feet. feet. So, so around 10 meters. I would say about 10 meters, yeah. Yep, yep. So, so Marcos. Marcos, OK. No, I'm not. Half so a meter, half meter to, even a to meter. 10, <laughs> it's 9 meter and a half. And yeah. 10 meters to 20, it's 10 meters. So I'm Yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah. he's right. He's so right. who won? Who Christoph won? <laughs> It's a mile of a millimeter there. <laughs> it's our guesstimation. Okay, next question about beer. So uh, Marco said... Billion, One billion. And Christoph? One billion. The really? answer is 2.3 billion liters. I won't believe it. So yeah, Marcos wins now. <laughs> okay, uh, so that's a tie. So next question, and Ray, are you keeping track of who wins each one? Yep. Okay, so the next one is about uh, the number of fans at the Rush concert in Brazil. So Marcos said... 250,000. And quarter Christoph million. said... A pass. 60,000 is the answer. So, yeah, so Marcos wins. Uh, next one is about lacrosse being declared the National Game of Canada. Uh, Christoph said... 19... Oh, Christoph didn't make it there. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. So the answer is 1856. I'm I'm guessing Marcos wins this whole thing. Marcos wins. So far, he's got three, and Kisaf only has two. So by by this point, yeah, yeah. Marcos has already won. So Neil Young won in uh, 1994. Uh, the film's gross of the Men in Broom Men with Brooms 
one hundred percent. That's what I was gonna say. Yeah, one hundred percent. So it was all <laughs> Canadian made and Canadian consumed. Uh, the next one is about the capacity of the uh, Montreal Expo Stadium, twenty eight thousand four hundred fifty six. And then finally, the uh, hockey night. The first number of people that tuned into the first radio broadcast was one hundred thousand. So thank you guys for playing. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you, I hope it was fun. And thanks for uh, thanks to Sven and the rest of the team for presenting. Um, so we're very happy to have you guys on board in our community as well as uh, Life Free Partners. So um, yeah, we will see you guys around. Thank thank you very much and uh, good luck for staying uh, another <laughs> staying uh, like fifteen hours. <laughs> With my uh, yeah, exactly. I better not get any beer. So. Yeah. <laughs> and Ray, Ray, we are waiting for you in uh, in Montreal once. Yeah, I was just talking about that in uh, on IRC, and uh, someone was asking me when, uh, you know, if I have we'll I've organize. never been to the office. But yeah, we definitely have to do something. We'll organize that. For yeah. Perfect. Let okay. me know. Bye bye. See you. Awesome. See you guys. See you guys. So then, uh, next, and we're a little bit late. Um, so we have uh, Vivek from Extivia. Hello, Vivek. Can you hear me? Hey, James. Can you hey. hear me? Yep, I can now. Awesome. So uh, why don't you, uh, I see there's a couple of others from Extivia, at least one other. Uh, Hugh is going to join us. Uh, so yeah, so welcome. Um, why don't you introduce yourself and the team, and we'll go from there. All right. So thank you for having us here, James. Uh, so I'm Vivek Agarwal with Extivia. I'm based in Austin, Texas. Um, I've been in the portal space and content management and collaboration and enterprise Java for a while. Uh, started with portal technology back in the year 2002 with IBM Web Studio Portal, and um, you know have moved on into LifeRay in the recent years. So, Extivia did a significant number of portal implementations and content management systems uh, for a variety of customers uh, in the US and actually back in the late 90s with Vignette in Europe. And uh, in recent years, since 2010, we have really switched focus from commercial products into LifeRay and uh, have had a lot of success uh, with Liferay and our customer base. Uh, I've actually got uh, one more person here with me, Derek Narenberg. Uh, the rest of the team couldn't quite make it for one reason or the other. So, Derek, you there? No, oh, Derek, you're muted. Uh, how about now? Yep, much better. Yeah, hi, everyone. So, uh, I'm Derek Narenberg. I'm an engagement manager with Extivia. Uh, I've done WebSeer portal, LifeRay portal. Actually, did the first LifeRay portal implementation with Deutsche Bank Asset Management back in, what do you say, back 2006? That's right. Early version 4, and have kind of grown with the technology uh, over the years. So that's kind of my background. Awesome. Yeah, it's a great platform. It's a lot of fun to work with. I mean, the way I always end up describing it to people is that. You know, if you're a developer, it's kind of like a playground. You know, if you take a look at some of the closed source or commercial products that come off the shelf, you don't have the access to the same tools uh, and the same source code that you would expect. So, you know, from that perspective, you just have so many other things that you can get into and understand about the product and come up with some really creative solutions for enterprise problems uh, that you see on a daily basis. A lot of the times, any solution that you have uh, that you come up with is going to be a combination of some of the core features that the product provides as well as custom development. You know, when you take a look at products like uh, uh, like WebSphere Portal, for example, you just don't have the same ability to deliver solutions in those environments. So it's great working with Library. And, you know, thanks a lot for everything that you guys do. Awesome. Yeah, we, we're, we're happy to have you guys as well. Um, so, Vivek, uh, did you have anything specific you wanted to show, or I got a bunch of questions for you, but uh, I kind of want to give you a chance. Really. So. so I thought that we would uh, try to do something in terms of sharing uh, some of the contributions that we're looking to make to the marketplace uh, in this day of life, but 
things just uh, got a little out of hand this last <laughs> week and <laughs> it, it haven't quite been able to get there. So, so you guys, we'll... I mean, so uh, Extivia, when I first joined, I mean, you were, you were, you know, you, you were a partner, obviously, and you were doing projects, but at the last symposium, you actually released some uh, framework, like, uh, what was it called, the dashboard framework, I think? That's, um, that's right. So, that's and right. that's, right. that is, you don't see that as often from, from partner companies as you do, you know, uh, case studies and stuff like that. So, it's really awesome that you guys are, uh, are participating in our community in that way. So, I was hoping that you could talk a little bit about your motivations for doing that and why you kind of want to do more than just, you know, client implementations. Right. So, you know, the thing is that, uh, yes, at, a, at its core, we are a systems integrator and we provide consulting services to customers and help them with implementations of LifeRay and other business solutions built on LifeRay. Now, as we've done various projects uh, with our customer base, we've seen common themes across those engagements. and. From those common themes, we've uh, taken some lessons and said, you know what, it'd be cool if we can come up with some tools or a toolkit that would basically help us bring some additional value to our customers right out of the bat, or right out of the gate, I should say. And, uh, you know, so some of the things that uh, we've got out there are one is the dashboard framework, which we announced in the symposium last year, and in fact, Derek presented about it. And that came out of the fact that, you know, as we've done uh, poll implementations, one of the needs that we often see across our customers is to have dashboards that present um, various executive views or um, operational views to the user base. And what we saw is that if you look at uh, the different dashboarding tools that are out there, and there are a significant number of those out there, both in the commercial as well as in the open source space. Uh, however, each of those tools wants to, quote unquote, own their canvas. So basically, they take over the complete screen and define what components or widgets go onto the dashboard. and. You know, the, yes, they provide some uh, tooling to help you quickly build out those dashboards. But then once you've built your dashboard, when it comes to integrating your dashboard into your pool investment, you're kind of out of luck you know, in some ways. You can either iframe it, in which case you've got a very static view of the dashboard that's being iframed in. And quickly what happens to happen there, there on is that, uh, you know, the customers say that they want to have different views for different roles, uh, maybe different views for users based in different geographies or different lines of business that they manage and so on. So um, what that results in is that uh, you want to end up creating multiple versions of the dashboard which present those different views. Now, you can easily imagine that if you have all these different uh, combinations of user roles, or you know, maybe that's an organizational role. So maybe you have roles such as store managers and store employees, and uh, uh, you know, sales uh, folks at various levels and executives at various levels, and they have access to data at different levels of granularity. So. The key thing that ends up happening is that you have an explosion of the number of views that you now need to create, manage right. using the dashboarding tool. So, um, and you're not leveraging the investment you've made in your portal in terms of identity management and access control and so on. So, really, um, that was a gap that we saw in the market space that we decided to plug by creating our own dashboarding solution, wherein you know you are able to configure our dashboarding tool via an XML file to point to a data warehouse. And once you've defined what KPIs or facts are available for display in your dashboard and what are the different dimensions you can slice and dice the data, then um, it's, and you've deployed the applications that uh, we provide on your life installation, then 
it's a simple matter of adding the portlets to the page and configuring uh, a given dashboard view. And uh, you can add multiple charts to the page. You can have pre-built filters that can be applied. So you know, one of the examples that we show in a demo, uh, which I don't have right now, is the sales dashboard, uh, which um, basically allows you to look at sales by different product clients, by different geographies, customer types, and so on. And uh, basically, uh, you can drill back by time. You can drill down by product line. So there are different views that are possible. And all of that is done in a truly integrated fashion with LifeRay, leveraging uh, life your investment in life in terms of access control and identities so um, that's a solution that we've actually taken a little further since the symposium in terms of productizing it one of the uh, challenges that existed back in October last year was that uh, if you wanted to plug in your own security filters on top of uh, the dashboard solution, say you wanted to enforce some rules wherein a user based on his um, organizational role as well as based on his geographic location had certain pre-built restrictions on what data he saw. Um, the way you had to do it was to implement a Java filter class and apply it directly in the WAR file that we provided. Well, coming, you know, having worked with LifeRay and seen how you all do the extensions and plugins model, we figured we'd learn a thing or two for you guys, from you guys and yeah. actually do that in our own framework. So we now support um, writing hooks into the Xtivia dashboard framework that allow you to plug in your own security manager or your own um, you know, custom charting uh, components if you want it on top of the three charting libraries that we support out of the box. So yeah, plugins, plugin architectures are uh, are always a good thing. Yes, well, maybe not always, but it makes sense. I mean, a lot you, know, of time. you don't want your customers going and modifying your source code <laughs> and modifying your. <laughs> we still have people that unzip uh, portalimple.jar and change portal.properties and zip it back up, and then uh, <laughs> deploy that instead of writing yeah. it poorly XT. But yeah, so yeah, it's it's really nice to see Xtivia. I mean. I consider that going above and beyond, which is like, I mean, maybe not, but it's not something you typically see. So it's really nice to see that because uh, you guys have a lot of expertise and you have a lot of a lot of experience. It makes total sense to productize stuff like that. So it's nice to see that. Right. Actually, there are a couple of other interesting that you know. Yeah, you guys got a bunch. What else? Actually, that uh, you know what? Maybe I can share a screen here. Let me see if I can get to this, OK? Let's see if this is, are you able to see my screen yep. and a window which is displaying? Um, a page from the Xtivia website where we talk about some of the components and frameworks that we've built on top of LifeRay. So one we talked about was the dashboard framework. Something else uh, that we have that we are particularly proud of is the personalization solution, which, uh, you know, so obviously LifeRay comes out of the box with a couple of different ways to do personalization. You've got the drool space personalization engine, um, and, you know, you can certainly support having content spots where um, the rules drive what kind of content shows up to the end user. So maybe to a platinum level customer, you show one type of content to a gold level customer, a different type of content, and silver, a different content, and so on. Um, but in addition to that, you know, we've also done things around leveraging uh, the role-based personalization in LifeRay by extending the roles to uh, dynamically built up memberships based on user profiles and doing personalization that way. But then, you know, um, there are situations which are more complex where um, basically you want to segment your users based on several different user profile attributes. So for example, you might be wanting to target all males in Texas over the age of 40 for a certain product or piece of content. And 
you know you want to slice and dice your user sec uh, your user population by different mechanisms or attributes and the exterior personalization solution allows you to create user collections based on a universe of user profile attributes and then leverage those user collections and personalizing content, navigation, uh, documents, and other custom artifacts. And you know, we rolled this in and um, an implementation we did for the principal financial group for their wellness business, and it was a huge success. You know, we had over 100 user profile attributes that we were personalizing on, wow. uh, thousands of user collections, and you know, many tens of thousands of pieces of content that were leveraging it. So that was another one that we're particularly proud of. Something else that we've got in the works is. Um, something uh, we call Xtivia Integration Platform. Uh, one of the guys from my team, Rex Peterson, uh, couldn't make it to this uh, conversation, but uh, um, basically he's been uh, spearheading that effort, which is more around something like rapid application development on top of Lifeway, so you can quickly consume services as well as produce services which uh, front Lifeway data. So there's a control panel portlet, which allows you to quickly go in and define services and then leverage those to build up UIs. So it's an interesting concept that we want to try and um, bring to the market uh, in the near term, as priorities allow, basically. <laughs> and then you know there is the um, then we have a few smaller components that we are looking to. Uh, have available in the marketplace um, as quickly as we can get past the standard refrain of the Packle issues. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, uh, I think you heard that a couple of times probably already today. <laughs> a couple? Yeah, a couple. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah. So, you know, on that front, uh, we do have one uh, portlet that's out there. It's uh, the uh, Carousel portlet. Yep. Um, you know, this. Really, you know, you can implement these carousels or slideshows on your sites uh, using uh, web content in Liferay. But one of the things that this portlet lets you do is that uh, it makes it easier for the business user or the content manager to up add a new image to the carousel by uploading it to the document library and then giving it a tag. And uh, by the way, it also <laughs> Forces access control, so you can have personalized carousels that show up based on cool. user roles. So, so that's out there, and then we have a few other things that uh, we're looking to bring in the Excel chart viewer. This was an idea that we stole from Plumtree. So Plumtree back in the day provided uh, the ability to um, upload an Excel file to the portal and then present the data from that Excel file via data grids as well as charts. Um, if you think about it, you know, Excel's got a lot of the business data that's out there in enterprises today. And uh, in some senses, it's also called the biggest BI tool out there, or the most widely used BI tool. And uh, what this Excel chart viewer lets you do is basically upload a file to Liferay's document library and then um, select what data you want to chart and uh, present through the portal. So anyways, you know what? Let me stop myself right here and uh, turn it back over to you uh, in terms of questions that you might might have. Um, tell me, so all of these uh, portlets are available today? I mean, the one, at least the carousel portlets on the marketplace, but are the other ones downloadable from the Xtivia website? So you like, know, this you is these? an interesting uh, situation that, you know, we thought about trying to make them available to the community. Uh, it was uh, early part of last year. And then at that point, you know, we were talking with Liferay about the Liferay marketplace. And you know, we figured that it would be more natural for us to distribute these yeah. portlets through the marketplace. And we've kind of held off on um, making them available from the exterior.com site simply because we don't want to undermine the marketplace to an extent. I and, see, I see. Um, so the hope is that you know there are two or three portlets that I think that we've pretty mm -hmm. much resolved the packle issues, so we're looking to make them available. 
um, in the next month. Um, yeah, the whole process then, for publishing the marketplace, I mean, regardless of, uh, of any tackle issues, uh, it should just get easier from here on out. Like we're trying to um, to streamline the QA process, you know, the the, the approval process. Right. Uh, so hopefully, you know, as we go on and we have GA three and uh, and we get our approval process streamlined, it should take, you know, no more than a couple days. I would hope from when you push the button to when it shows up on the marketplace. Right. So so yeah, so I, I can understand why you'd want to hold off. For now, um, so I have one more question for you. Um, tell me about the uh, Austin user group and the uh, and if you actually and if you want or if you could, we always like to see sites built on Liferay. If you guys have any no sites way. you're publicly allowed to show as Extivia uh, produced, that would be awesome too. Okay. Okay. Um... So, you know, the majority of the sites that we end up doing are self-service portals that are mostly um, behind closed doors, so yeah. in the sense that you have to log in. But there are a few public-facing sites that we've built on LifeRate that uh, I'd like to pull up. So I did pull up marines.com, which was a site that we did in coordination with uh, JWT, which is a major... Um, agency that does design work and we were brought in as the life ray experts to help them get the concept implemented and perform and, and so on. So uh, this is a site that's very rich in terms of content and uh, you know it's got uh, the nice mega drop downs and so on. So all of this was built uh, on top of life ray with Xtevia doing providing the library expertise. Um, another site that is out there is toolprotect.com, which is a site which uh, one of our customers, Cross Country Home Services, had us develop on top of Liferay, wherein um, this site is geared towards homeowners that might be interested in buying home warranty or home maintenance plans. Right. So there's an e-commerce element to it. Um, CCHS.com is the same company's public-facing site, their main .com site. Uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Alabama. Um, so we've done a few different sites for them. We're in, uh, in the process of implementing their provider portal as well as their member portal. And that's actually a project that Derek uh, leads. So um, that's out there. Um, and then this is yet another site for BCBSAL. And there are a few others that I didn't really bother pulling up, but we do have some public-facing sites. Uh, in addition to that, as I said, there are some sites that we've built for um, customers and partners and employees that uh, we have case studies for on uh, which are co-branded case studies as well, actually. So principles, a co-branded case study. We have uh, another one that should be releasing very soon on liferay.com for tractor supply. So, cool. uh, so Liferay Austin user group, um, you know, that's, you know, thanks to your uh, support, you know, we were able to get that going back in November 2011. Yep, and, you're one of the first uh, ones. Yeah, and we've had four meetups. Um, we are obviously a little behind in terms of uh, having a meetup on Feb 2013. Um, look, you're looking to rectify that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, so. it does take a lot of energy and time to uh, to keep user groups going, but uh, it's definitely worth it. Um, yes, I mean it's been you know, so we've had a chance to pull in some folks from the Austin and Central Texas area uh, into the user group, and uh, it's been good discussions. Uh, we've had folks you know present on various topics from you know back in November we had a an introduction to Life Race Six One. We've had discussions on uh, the Xtivia integration uh, platform on uh, the dashboard solution. We've, you know, we've done a few different things here. Uh, and uh, 
typically there's beer and food involved, so that's always fun. <laughs> Punch and pie. Yeah, that's good. I wish I could join you guys more often. Yeah, love to have you. Huh. Derek, do you, you want to chime in with some thoughts? Uh, about the user group? Or just yeah. in general? In, uh, Either I mean, in general, I'm just uh, really yeah. appreciative of everything that everyone at Library has been doing to, to keep the product up to date and all the, the work that's going on with the newer technologies and making sure that things are integrated, like, you know, OSGI and, uh, and some of the upcoming features. So really appreciative of all the work that you do there. It just makes our job that much easier. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. So we're a, little, a couple minutes over. Um, I appreciate you guys sticking around. Um, it's always great to talk to you guys. Um, and congrats again for the uh, North American Partner of the Year Award in 2012. So that was really fun. Thank so, you. Um, yeah. Um, okay. So let's um, let's move on uh, if you guys don't mind. Um, and we'll thank Extivia, and you guys are can you're welcome to stick around. I know you're probably pretty busy, but uh, if you want to, you're more than welcome to. Um, so next on, we're gonna have Dave uh, Weitzel. Is it Weitzel? Correct. Yeah. Yeah, Dave. Uh, so um, so Dave, I am going to uh, step away for a moment, and Ray OJ is going to uh, be my uh, my surrogate host for a couple of minutes. So. Um, I'm Not going tonight. to turn it over to you. Uh, I've prompted him with a couple of questions for you. But, uh, well, um, it'll probably be about the War of 1812, I imagine. <laughs> <laughs> no hard feelings. Nothing actually changed in that war. I, I didn't actually know that. that no, no boundaries changed as a result of that war. Although in, in August, I'm reenacting the burning of the White House. <laughs> it's the 200th it's anniversary. The, this August, the 200th anniversary. Yeah, there was actually <laughs> fighting going on like a month, like several months after the, uh, the the peace treaty was signed. So it took yeah. a while for news to get around. There was yeah. no internet. No internet. Then. No. Nope. All right. So uh, yeah, Dave. Um, so thanks again for joining us, um, and uh, I will be right back. Okay. Uh, hi. I uh, hopefully I can. Um, drive this interface or whatever in an appropriate way. <laughs> it's, it's never quite sure uh, what we're meant to be doing here. And uh, apologies for the mess behind me. I should have looked behind before I uh, came on anyway. <laughs> so, well, it's uh, good to see you, Dave. Hey, hey, Ray. Yeah. <laughs> it's good to see you. You seem to have been on most of the day. Is that right? Well, I'm I'm uh, trying to be back up for James, who took on quite a responsibility in, <laughs> in, in making this whole 24-hour uh, show work. So I'm going to try yeah. and step in every once in a while and just give him some breathers. Uh, but uh, hopefully I'll be as entertaining as he is. He's uh, he's big uh, uh, big shoes to fill for uh, for doing interviews. But he did prompt me with a few questions. Really? Uh, right. A couple interesting ones, in fact. So... First, though, I'd like you to interest, introduce yourself and, and kind of talk about, you know, what you do and how you how you are a member of the Life Free community. Yeah, I was um, just, just going to see if I've got a screen share I can uh, bring up. Mm -hmm. So there we go, Day in the Life of Teamware <laughs> for Life Free. <laughs> Okay, I'm uh, the general dog's body for Teamware in the USA. Um, we are a very small software company. We uh, operate out of the USA and Finland for historical reasons, which may come in to play here. So what I'm planning to do today, or I can help you do, is uh, we're going to, first of all, meet the team in our daily conference room, but hosted on our life ray internet, talk about where we are, and uh, so on how we work in the international world because we staff have to have a seven hour time difference but first of all to answer your question who are two teamware and why are we in life ray and we'll open office to move on right who are teamware we actually came out of a uh, our history goes back to Nokia data back in the 1980s the inventors of the Windows-based email application. And we came through various uh, 
acquisitions and then uh, floating as freestanding companies to be Teamwork Group, focusing on uh, intranet, extranet, and internet solutions, uh, more particularly Groupware, as the name Teamwork supplies. And back in 2001, the Teamwork Inc. in the US was set up by myself and my uh, co partner. And we did a management buyout of a product that was called Teamware Plaza, which was the full website and online community system that Teamware ran. And that, until like 2004, 2005, we decided we actually had to replace because it was completely host running on our own Java based Phoenix servlet engine. And impossible for us really to maintain, given the uh, financial restrictions of what was now a very small software company, uh, and the need to maintain. You know, web, we were struggling to get Web 2.0 when everyone else wanted Web 3.0 or whatever. So we looked around at our, the opportunities that existed in open source, and we selected LifeRay to be our new platform. So it's taken us two years, but we do now actually have our first life rate based customers. We have our own websites and we have our own intranet and we're busy trying to write modules and plugins to address our target markets, which are the associations in the USA and local government in Finland. So that's who we are, what we do uh, to answer that question, Ray. <laughs> Excellent. So how how um, so you have a small team and you're distributed. How does that how does being distributed affect your your day to day? How does uh, sometimes it extends it a lot of hours. I can give you a, a view actually here. My next slide, which is if you'll like this one. This is actually a capture I did of on our intranet where we use big blue button conferencing to uh, connect between on the right there, top right is me in my dining area, which is a bit nicer background than today. Our CEO in the bottom right, who you see talking a lot, and the rest of the team in Finland who don't like to, they're hiding around a table. So we have a daily conference at eight o'clock Eastern time to uh, basically go through our agile rally tasks, or our scrum tasks and keep track of that. And then we use the intranet, obviously, for documentation, uh, a little bit of Skype, and lots of emails to keep things going around. Do you, um, so how um, you're involved in the life rate community, are you involved, um, in what aspects are you involved in, in Life rate community or in open source in general? Is it, is it, well, give me, not, give me right. some examples. We're not as involved as we would like to be. I guess when we were a bigger or part of a bigger software company, we had much more fingers in many pies. I, I knew people who were on various standards bodies for workflow uh, before workflow was even a word, I think. Process management or something like that, it was called in those days. Um, I even worked with the brother of T Tim Berners-Lee a long time ago. So when we started with LifeRay, we, one of the things we wanted to try and do was share this 15 years of running community websites uh, and our understanding of how particularly the group's model worked within the non-profit and associations uh, area. But like all good things, good intentions, uh, time has been the biggest restriction on doing, getting too involved on at least submitting requirements and specifications like that. I have tried to build up a DC use, life ray user group. And the biggest problem we have there is that there's nowhere to host it in DC. Um, believe it or not, because right. all the projects that seem to be handling in DC are on government property or whatever. There's no partner based in DC. We've got Rivet Logic out to the west, and we've got, I uh, can't remember themselves now, in Annapolis out to the east. So uh, I'm the only one who's in DC, uh, but we're uh, 
so we've had a I've organized I picked it up after someone who was running it left for Chicago I think got a contract in Chicago and just dropped it without passing it on I picked it up and we're trying we've had a couple of meetings and it's well overdue for the next one but meeting in a bar doesn't seem to be the best way of actually sharing information and you know, not being able to demonstrate and stuff like that right right so how does whiskey play into this equation I'm told to ask you <laughs> about whiskey. Well, you know, uh, it's almost we could have. This is my next slide. <laughs> Welcome to Washington D.C. And you see my my where well, I do my conference calls in the morning and most of my good work in the evening uh, is in my dining area in my condo, which, as you can see, the top there are a lot of empty whiskey bottles. <laughs> <laughs> and I was suggesting we could do around the world of whiskey. But just to show you that I do in based in DC, the the background pictures here were taken this morning. So I have a nice big cherry tree right outside my house. It's in full bloom today, and the view. If I turn to my left, I look out of that window, and that is the Washington Monument. I don't know if you can actually tell in the Washington Monument in the yeah, middle I of see that it. picture. I see it there. Yeah. It's actually got scaffolding halfway up it because of the earthquake. So. Uh, so the whiskey is all to do with, typically I'm working within an arms grab of a couple of nice <laughs> bottles of, actually it tends to be bourbon these days, I'm uh, getting to be an American. <laughs> <laughs> is that due to life, Ray, or is that due to... <laughs> um, possibly, at times I have to, there are some big issues we seem to have with life, Ray. <laughs> we're, we're, we're doing a lot of quite complex things, it turns out to be. Uh, having spent two years fixing user interfaces to do what we thought it would be and developing code that would we like to be able to install a package solution and so we have a lot of um, site templates and page template layouts and categories and uh, whole taxonomies that we preload and so we coded all of that up we're now into things like membership applications for people to join an association and the number of objects we find that we aren't allowed to create, or it's not very obvious how we create objects. Um, like we're not allowed. Them in a bundle. Well, well, yeah, we can't create an address. Oh, I see. And then so limitations in the in, so the, in the, frame, in the framework. In the framework, in what yeah. what developers have access to, and uh, I did. Just before we came on live, I did at least find out that I could put some item in a shopping cart. I now have to find out how I get the shopping cart to be the next page the user sees. Right. And even just a simple thing of coding how someone logs in to, to code, you know, if you fill in, you fill in the uh, application form, so in the background we create a user and then we want to log them in so the next page we've got the context of who's, who's logged in but it was quite hard to find that sort of information within the uh, environment of life right <laughs> right so this, these are areas we need to grow in we're, we're still uh, we're still uh, learning the right way to build things a, a lot ourselves because it's it again we're we're uh, we're growing organically we're we're we're, uh, we're trying to improve our development uh, um, design process so let's say like right. uh, we're trying to make the framework more developer friendly at least that's one of the goals that I have in mind and it's it's uh it's good for us to hear the pains that are that third parties and developers who are using our, our life ray are, are suffering and um, yeah I keep meaning to have a discussion with um, rich which says off yeah it's like taking the uh, life ray in action type examples and the the documentation that is now there which is incredibly good compared to what it was 18 right. months ago yeah so it's moved on a lot and how we can actually start Building a, a set of you know, um, real life examples, mm -hmm. uh, and the same actually applies with believe it or not AUI, because that's right. moved on from what it was wanting to be and is now far more than it was. That was just a user interface helper for people writing portlets in LifeRay. 
<laughs> and I, I'm not sure if you were on earlier this morning, but we had uh, Zena Rocha and uh, Eduardo Langren who who have uh, tried to nurture that whole project, and and they built out the new uh, Aloeui dot com website with lots of examples, and and that's that's the kind of thing that we're trying to go in the direction that you just stated, which is to 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 give some real world examples, put together some context or and document proper documentation around a lot of the right. functionality that Liferay has. One of the one of the things, and I don't want to take over the conversation, but one of the no, things no. Liferay has had a difficult doing uh, difficult job doing is to actually uh, promote a lot of the functionality that it's built uh, inside the portal as an individually usable concept. Uh, uh, Liferay is usually we we assume that you're gonna, or or the assumption is you're taking this big bundle that is Liferay and then doing something with it. But a lot of the internals, uh, we never really we, or we don't talk about enough and we don't explain enough how the use cases are supposed to be implemented and, and so on. So that's 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 part of the work that we have to. That's part of the stuff we have to improve on. Right. Yeah, it's uh, fine. It's, it's it's certainly been a, a good experience, and from a personal point of view, I've uh, been uh, very happy with the way we've been received and the education. Did all the training courses and the like, and trying to get involved in the community side of things as much as time will allow us to do. So, are you uh, delivering? a complete product on top of Liferay or are you trying to um, have a set of modules that will go into marketplace or that you're going to package and deliver in, uh, separately or are you delivering a turnkey solution or, or just uh... Uh, well we, we try to deliver a package but then of course everything has to get customized okay um, I've actually got two two slides two more slides that might cover that one we, which is our, our vision slide from back in 1995 when all the internet was was static HTML which is like an e-brochure and the various releases of Teamware Plus has been trying to deliver more and more interaction um, between people so the various things there and you see the final thing which some things you understand semantic publishing and uh, the like uh, mobile services and that's what we're trying to do with the latest the life ray based um, teamware uh, teamware plaza teamware plaza 6 and if we actually have a look at what's in teamware plaza 6 I amended this to highlight the various areas we're trying to develop and add on to the standard um, life ray product but there's one or two others where we have certainly hooked and enhanced with expandos things like event management but out of the box, we're trying to use as much as possible the content management. That was the main reason we took it, because our old content management was useless. Um, and work with the online communities and workspaces that's there. But online registrations for meetings, payment systems for registrations, for membership applications, for dues renewals, uh, the whole life cycle of being an, org an uh, um, association member. Uh, we're looking at surveys, been talking with Extivia about whether we can borrow their surveys portal and work with them for improving it in the life ray world. Uh, haven't come to any final discussion yet, no decision yet on that, but it would be nice if we could work with them on that. Uh, and the whole email services. Um, and we were specking out an email service just this week to. Uh, to try to give an interface where all the additional emails that we need to send as part of a membership can be managed from, but then work as the underpin of a mass ma mailing system, a personalized uh, email. And in, hopefully we we'll might be able to extend LifeRay's capabilities to send your email out in the locale of the user you're sending it to, which is a big problem that you currently got. So those are the sort of areas we're trying to extend, but the basic website and most of the services is out of the box life, right? Awesome. 
Well, uh, we have James back. Ah. And uh, James, if you have any questions or... Uh, <laughs> so, want... Dave, I, I missed the last 20 minutes. Could you repeat everything? You said? <laughs> I'll send you the slide set. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I won't because he's got a 30-minute video in it. Yeah, I think I've seen that presentation <laughs> at some point in the past. And I have, I have cheese it too, so. No, no, no. no, no. <laughs> I actually have a 30-minute, using Snagit, I'd forgotten I'd said it recording, <laughs> the uh, uh, morning conference that we have with Finland every day. Nice. We, ha we did have some fun doing our own corporate website and making it responsive, which I'm not sure how many people have seen responsive websites. Yeah, I mean, responsive is one of those topics that uh, is very popular these days because um, everybody has a mobile device and everybody's device is different. So, yeah, if you want to talk about that, so, that would be well, awesome. Let's um, bring up TeamwearePlaza.com, which is written in Finglish because this is the Teamware Plaza is our corporate identity in Finland. So this really is content for the Finnish, but has a lot of English. We've did an English version, we will be bringing out a teamwareinc.com, which will be our own for the US market. But you see it in the full screen, we have a nice flyout menus with lots of pictures, and we have these four main boxes. But then as we uh, bring, in the, bring in the screen, everything scales, all the images scale down here, and we come to a two by two instead of a four by one. Uh, pattern for the portlets. Trying to think at what point though. 720 is another point where we drop all the on the menu. Most of our changes here is with the menus and the images and the text and font sizing. And we can then come down to a even smaller one where we move out the menu here. And we by this time moved into a four a one by four column. And when you're on a really pathetic old phone, then we cut out the menu and just go to the site map, which is at the bottom. So that was good fun on uh, how to play with responsive design on our corporate website, which was, uh, I think I was doing that most of the time while we were in the symposium last year. <laughs> yeah, Dave, <laughs> uh, time then. and one of the test sessions I saw I don't know if you've talked about it yet, but you had quite a whiskey collection. Yeah, we, we, we talked about that. I had a oh, okay. picture of me uh, with my whiskey bottles in the background and also <laughs> the cherry trees and the Washington Monument. Nice. So, yeah, it's on my... Uh, <laughs> just, just for you, James, I might bring it back. I don't know, man. I'm not, we might have to revoke your card. You might be a, we might be a British spy. Drinking <laughs> <laughs> whiskey, taking pictures of the White House. I don't know. Yeah, this is. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, you were, see, were you born? Even... Oh, nice, nice. I also saw a picture of you uh, with it looked like uh, Billy Banks or some. Oh, on my Facebook page. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Billy Banks. I'm a big Thai boa. He's actually really? older than me. So until until uh, until I get to be older than him. <laughs> <I've got laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was like, wait a minute, I know that guy. <laughs> the amazing thing about that, considering a guy invented this workout, yeah, there's like one in 30 in the classes we have here, uh, guys. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps two or three on oh, a Saturday yeah, yeah, morning. Yeah. There's like 40, 40 people working out on a Saturday morning, and, and at the most we've got three guys. So it's, uh, Billy Banks Boot Camp. Yeah, these, uh, but it's, uh, it's a good workout. <laughs> That's cool. Well, uh, I appreciate you being on today, and I know uh, you've also done some work in our, our uh, community leadership team. So for those watching, uh, every quarter we have a meeting of about 10 or 15 people, depending on who can make it. Uh, the, some of the people who are not just invested in Liferay, but invested in our community and invested in, uh, in open source, uh, we get together and kind of talk about things like the community survey came out of that. The community right. survey that we did last year uh, came out of that. So, uh, and so Dave is uh, is a very active member of that particular meeting. Um, so it's great to see the activity, or it's great to see your volunteerism, Dave, because that's kind of what makes our community tick. So. Yeah, well, 
try our best. Don't have enough yeah. time to do it all. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Okay. All so right. Well, uh, any, we're... any quiz or competitions going on then, James? <laughs> not right now. Not right now. Uh, Did you want to do We actually have. No. Um, actually, I take that back. Um, so we are going to do one. Uh, I was hoping to do one. So we could do one at the end of Jamie's session. Okay. Um, or we can wait until Rich's, which is at uh, 5.30 Eastern. Um, oh, the problem with Jamie's session is it bumps up against uh, two guys, Brendan and Arun from Oracle. And uh, they scare me because they're from a really cool, well, big and respected company. So yeah, I have, I, to go, I've, I have to go to Ford's Theatre this evening to volunteer. Oh, yeah. Nice. And to t tell all the kids all about Abraham Lincoln. And, uh, Is that where he was shot? <laughs> yep, where he was shot. You actually have, <laughs> you have the seat that uh, Martha was sitting on. Nice. Not Martha. What was his wife's name? I, I shall refresh myself when I get there. I don't know. Well, anyways, yeah, we're having a history the trivia. The was there. So, uh, yeah, Ford's Theatre tonight, so I have to uh, leave around 5.45 to uh, oh. get downtown for that. Um, uh, yeah, hello. Dolly, if you good musical. <laughs> well, stick around. I don't know if we have time to do it at the end of Jamie's session. Uh, we'll see. We might. Yeah, I'll keep you. I'll, I'll listen in. Okay. It's um, better than listening to music. It's quite good fun today. <laughs> <laughs> see what kind of trouble we can get into. Yeah. Okay. Well, I appreciate it, Dave. Um, oh, okay. Been fun. Okay. Well, we'll see you next time. And yeah. so. Thanks, thanks, Ray, for standing in for James. Oh yeah, yeah. Thank you, Ray. I was no able problem. to thanks, eat guys. some lunch <laughs> and uh, use the little boys' room, so I was happy for that. Uh, okay, so next up is uh, let's see what time is it? It's four o'clock Eastern. Um, next up, we have Jamie Sammons. So, uh, welcome, Jamie. Are you there? Yep. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. Uh, so, uh, Jamie's also a longtime uh, community member um, and Life Ray. Uh, user, enthusiast, developer, contributor, whatever. Um, whatever you can imagine can be done in the community. Jamie's probably done it. So, um, so Jamie, let's uh, tell us who you are and tell us a little bit, little bit about yourself. All right. Well, my name is Jamie Sammons. Um, I'm a web technical architect at CDS Global out, out of Des Moines, Iowa. Um, CDS, uh, they do many different things across... Um, mobile industry, so I just kind of cherry-picked a couple, you know, things to talk about um, that I guess some of our listeners could be interested in. Uh, we kind of started our roots in the mag magazines and media uh, business, writing services to the publishers, such as subscription processing, customer service, and e-commerce, um, so that the publishers could focus on their content. Uh, we've branched out into other industries since then. Um, we're doing a lot around e-commerce solutions, order management, fulfillment, customer service um, for consumer products. Um, what's interesting there is we standardized our e-commerce platform on an open source product called Magento. Um, we're really strong in that community as well. Um, and we actually have several CDS employees at the Magento Imagine Conference kind of representing this week. So I think they're presenting, they have a booth. So. It's just another, you know, open source product we got a lot of investment in. Yep. Um, the other thing, other big, one of the other big things that we offer services for is nonprofits. Um, so we offer a wide, wide array of services for missions-based nonprofit organizations. Um, so that we can handle a variety of donations pro processing, such as paper processing and electronic processing. Um, along with our data capture system, which can read and store almost any document. Um, we also do the donor acknowledgement, um, which handles the printing, personalization, and mailing of donor acknowledgement. So if there's any nonprofits listening, there's, there's probably some stuff we can do for you. And then we handle the marketing to go along with the mission to help acquire new donors. So, so that's just really a couple things of the many, many things we do. So. Um, if there's any any of that sounds interesting, feel free to hit our website. See what we can do for you. So shameless plug warning. I shameless guess plug. <laughs> yeah, get all your plugs out of the way. <laughs> all right, so we got that out of the way now. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, that's right. it's perfectly <laughs> fine. You do a lot uh, for us, so. Um, 
Yeah, so so you did a uh, presentation at the at the I guess it was the West Coast Symposium. Well, there's only one now, right? Yeah, well, but when you were when you did it, it was I think we still had two. Oh, right. We well, we did. I did uh, one with you, and then I did one that, this last year. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was uh, running around like crazy this year. Um, so the one you did uh, the first time. So that was more about like. Uh, that was, a, I guess, we both did a presentation around uh, community. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the motivation for your company to allow you to essentially, you know, spend your time during the day giving free stuff away, essentially. Um, well, I think I think the main driving factor with that is um, they know, like, you know that. The time I spend with the community, I'm going to be more familiar with how Liferay works. Um, we also build up relationships there with other community members and Liferay employees. Um, so I think I think what's really interesting from that standpoint um, is we kind of get our hands into the product long before it's actually ready to ship, so we can test all of our stuff and get it all fixed, if you will before it even ships. So what's interesting about that is um, the day that a version of Life Ray actually ships out the door, we're pretty much ready to go on it. So, and I think that has a lot to do with being involved in that community, you know, when it, during the development process. So we learned so much about it. So a lot of it's the shared knowledge. Um, and we, as a company, don't mind that, it, that this this testing that we do and these bug reports that we do can help others too. So there's nothing wrong with helping everyone, I guess. Um, so, I mean, as, as far as like the benefits of the community to you, to your company in particular, what what kinds of stuff have you guys seen uh, from the community that has you know specifically impacted the work that you do at CDS Global? Um. I mean, like, it's really just, I guess, a knowledge transfer, if you will, um, and be just being familiar with how the product works, and if we have any questions about uh, anything, really, um, I guess it helps with that. I don't know if that's a very good answer, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, that's all right. Um, can, I, can you show us your, the website that you guys use internally, like the one built on LifeRay? Um, well, I actually have a couple things I was thinking about doing. I was going to center a lot of stuff around social office. Yes, yeah, that was the other thing I wanted to talk about. Um, I guess that's kind of an interesting thing, too. Um, we actually started off with life for a round social office because um, we were tasked, I guess, many years ago with trying to solve this thing called collaboration. We're still trying to figure out what that means exactly because it can mean a lot of different things. <laughs> um, so it's interesting. We actually came across um, Life Ray, and, the, and there was a they were promoting Social Office One at the time. Um, and then there was you know an email link email if you would like more information on it. So it sounded good. Uh, so funny thing is, is I emailed it, and some guy named Brian Chung returned my inquiry. <laughs> yeah, um, our CEO. <laughs> So I didn't know that at the time, so I figured that out later. So it was kind of interesting to know that Life Ray CEO kind of had a, you know, an interest in it as well. So I think it's been kind of one of his pet projects. Yeah, and he, he jumps on the uh, on the forums occasionally and answers, but uh, not too often anymore. So that was just kind of an interesting sign up. So we did actually start off with Social Office 1.0, which was based off of a pre-release of Life Ray 5.2. So a little rocky, but we loved what it was doing. Um, so we stuck with it. It was actually us and our research team. Um, we're using the wiki pretty heavily. And we uh, that's actually how I became involved in the community. I started turning around bug reports on Social Office One, which um, does sometimes become bug reports on Life Report because that's what it runs on. Right. Um, so we were turning in things on both, really. and. But if memory serves me correctly, I think I turned in around 50 Jira tickets on Social Office One. Nice. <laughs> so <laughs> good and bad. Giving it a good run. So, 
Um, and actually, we just recently went to Social Office 2, um, Enterprise Edition. Um, and about last November, we were approached by some members of our customer service team. Um, they had a rather large wiki stored in a hosted provider, and the company had changed hands, come back, had financial issues, and it really came down to um, they were going out of business December 31st last year. Um, we really became aware of that at the beginning of November, so we didn't have much time to act. Yeah. Um, so we actually ended up contracting out with Youngsoft to help us write an importer. I think I talked to Ray too a little bit about it <laughs> um, to see the best way to get this data moved over. I mean, we're talking a 10,000 article wiki. This is no small thing. It's basically our customer services encyclopedia. Um, so the good news is, is we were able to do it. So we were successful when the lights went out. We had over 1,500 users moved into Social Office. Nice. Um, so it was a great story, and it, it was kind of one of those things where it just had to land in place just right. Or it, I mean, it was just it was a lot, lot dealt with luck. <laughs> now, a, a lot of what uh, the changes in, in Social Office 2.0 was that instead of kind of a purpose-built, unmodifiable app, it's now a set of plugins built on top of LifeRay, which means, among other things, that you can now customize it. Like, you can add your own portlets to individual pages and uh, make more customizations that you could previously not do with the 1.x line. So I'm curious, um, what did you guys do back in the day before 2.0 as far as when you needed to customize something? I mean, did you write, did you rewrite, basically? bits and pieces of it? Well, we didn't do a whole lot, I guess, customizing when it was, I will call it kind of a special instance. Um, we basically branded it. Um, I actually did a screen share, I yeah, think. Yeah. Um, this, this is actually our 2.0 running on our base library portal. This is my dashboard. Um, so the important part here is, is it is baked right into our product. Um, our main I guess life ray sites, if you will, or the client portal and employee portal on the list. Um, and what's I mean, what's nice about too is it's it's not just integrated; it really is part of the base portal. Um, so, I, what I wanted to show here is the branding. We basically rebranded it with what we did in our base portal. So, if I flip to our client side of our base portal. So similar branding. This is kind of a brown color. Yep. Um, and if I flip back, then we just we gave Social Office kind of its own brand, but overall it's it's what we've already designed, so we could just reuse that, which was great. Um, and then the other thing, see if I can get there. So that is a, that is actually one case where we did that. So this is that actual customer service site we moved over. So we did it again. We actually gave it its own look and feel. So it's nice. I guess the point is, is it was just real easy to reuse that uh, knowledge um, and quickly crank out custom themes for actual social office based on what we already knew from Life Recordal. So, um, so yeah, this, this was a I'm going to go ahead and close it there, but that, yeah, that was a pretty big undertaking, highly successful, and pretty much all of our customer service reps were in that social office site using it nonstop. So and you said it's about uh, 1,500 users, you said, overall? Yeah. About, it, last I checked, it was 1,500 users, and actually some of those are our clients, too, because they do customer, their own customer service, but link in to us. Nice. And how's that? How do you expose the site to them? Do they have like a VPN thing, or um, is it... it's just public access? Oh, it's public we, access. We, okay. we actually have Open AM in front of LifeRay, so they technically log into it first, um, right? And get to what they need to from there. So, so what other um, what other open source projects do you guys consume, 
or and or contribute to? Well, I'm, as I mentioned earlier, another really large one is the Magento Commerce stuff. Yeah. Um, and to the fact point that we got guys contributing to that, and they're presenting that at the conference as we speak out in Las Vegas. Um, so we're we're really strong in that community too. So, um, yeah, I guess just another one that we're re really adopting the open source model here. So, yeah, you guys have been uh, a big um, user of Social Office as well as we just saw. I think, so I think we were the first. Oh, uh, the first. Like social the Office fourth, user. like 1.x social office? Yes, 1.0. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you probably... When I went to the conference, um, I kept getting told, hey, it's user number one. <laughs> I'm like, okay, that's good, I guess. <laughs> yeah, funny bit of trivia, Brian Chan is actually user ID 2. Is he? Like, .com. Yeah, <laughs> it's pretty funny. I, I think 1 is the test user, and then 2 is Brian Chan, and then... I don't know how it happened, but um, now you know, the counter service in LifeRay, uh, that's what our employee number, employee IDs are based off of. So my employee ID is like in the five, five, nine, five hundred ninety-one thousand something wow. there. Yeah. So well, I mean, it's it's just a counter that counts stuff. So it's not surprising. It's just funny that there, you know, your employee ID is going to be this twelve-digit string pretty soon. So uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so let's see, you are in Des Moines? Yes, west, technically west Des Moines. Nice and gloomy here today. <laughs> <laughs> are there any uh, open source user groups that you participate in or in the area? I'm curious. If I, I personally do not. I know there are some around, but I really just based on time. I hadn't had time to check any of them out, I guess. And uh, how many uh, how many employees do you guys have that work like on LifeRay? Is it just you? Um, it's pro directly like with development, probably five to ten, maybe. I mean, we got people doing the design work, development work, administration work, and I do more of the I guess under the underlying infrastructure stuff. At this and point. It's, so. Uh, I know you guys use social office. What about the features in the base portal? I'm curious which ones you guys use and which ones you know about and you think are cool or maybe you think are not cool, but you don't ever use them because it has no real world application for you. Um, we we use quite a bit of the out of the box applications. Um, really, what comes to mind? We do a lot with the asset publisher and web content manager. Um, we on. We basically have our portal split because it services employees and clients, and we have a custom redirector in place depending on which one of those you are. It'll send you to a specific site, and both of those kind of mirror some information. So we got uh, forums, document library. Um, I know a wiki spinning up, and we have probably about 20 custom applications that we wrote to. Um, yeah, it just seems like. We are using more and more stuff as time goes on. I know another thing that the customer service group started using quite a bit was the web uh, form portlet. Uh oh, you still there? Hello. Yep. Are you sorry if we're having some kind of network problem there? Or at least maybe I was. Yeah, let's so. say we're, we're a little froze. I think we're back now. <laughs> yep. So, uh, yeah, so the last thing I heard was network forum. Um, we uh, basically, we, we host a forum in both the client and employee side. Oh, and we use the web forum portlet. A web forum, that's what I heard, yeah. yeah. That's what I was saying. We use that quite a bit now, too. Uh, it seems like as time goes by, we start using more and more out of the box functionality. So, yeah, I don't think it, that will quit anytime soon as new needs come in. I see, I see. Um, okay, uh, what else? Um, I guess what I'm doing quite a bit right now is, well, I'm trying to find more time to do this, is trying to do more stuff around the upcoming 6.2. Um, I'm actually using the opportunity to re-engineer the whole, I guess, portal infrastructure from the ground up. So I mean, we're talking, we're digging down to the base infrastructure. 
I'm think, thinking maybe about uh, doing some stuff with OpenVZ even, um, which is a container-based technology. Um, so it's this is a kind of a reboot. This is what we're kind of deeming version five of the portal product. Um, so if we're kind of just starting over. And my hopes is is it'll be based around six two when we have it already. Um, so I'm doing a lot there with uh, Jenkins, um, and I'm trying to wrap this into the bug squad testing too. Um, so the ultimate goal is. Is to have an automated way to basically build the master how to GitHub and integrate in our artifact artifacts and make sure everything works properly. Um, and if obviously if we run into any problems, then we can report on those. What so, was the name of your uh, your Jenkins uh, environment? Um, I just call it L a Life Rebuild. It's LR Build is the name of it. Oh, I was, oh. I thought you had a, a a different name for it. I was teasing that it could stand for Leroy Jenkins, <laughs> That's right. which is a famed World of Warcraft meme. Yep, that's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I actually, it actually emails me from Leroy Jenkins, so <laughs> you get a little Leroy chuckle every time you get an email. Builds are working. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, exactly. Love Jenkins, and, that, and actually, even when there's a released version of Life Ray, I hook Jenkins into the database upgrade bundle and and just automate that whole process. So at the end of the day, when I, I do a release, I kick out a bundle that's ready to roll in production. So it's got nice. all of our plugins integrated in, our database is upgraded, the latest life free codes there, extensions, hooks, portlets, whatever, and it's just sitting there waiting for me to dump it on prod and release it. So that Jenkins is really awesome for that kind of stuff. Yeah, Jenkins is really nice. It's very nice. Yeah, I used to work with uh, Kosuke at Oracle, well, at Sun, at the time, like the uh, in or the creator of Hudson, mm -hmm. which became Jenkins. So yeah, it's really cool. We used to use it all the time in, at Sun as well uh, for automating, but essentially automating builds. Uh, but I know it can do so much more now. But I uh, that, that's that's my experience with Jenkins is an easy way to kick off builds on different machines. I think uh, you. It, it, it's you can do whatever you want with it. It seems like there's no limit to the possibilities. It's, yeah, yeah. I'm using it for a lot of different things. So I'm actually building up these build machines on OpenVZ as well. So we're starting starting from the bottom basically, and getting the even getting the build on, over on there. So I'm hoping um, I'll be able to get our stuff moved. And one of the things I got to do is we uh, we did a lot of stuff with hooks in 6.1 around the asset publisher. I'm real excited to change that over to ADTs. Yeah, ADT is cool. It's really cool. Because um, I think that that functionality in the hooks is probably going to go away because of the ADTs, which is great because it looks a lot easier to manage. You mean the JSP overriding? Yeah. Yeah. We're just, we're just overriding the JSP. For I different. doubt that it will go away. Uh, I mean, I doubt that we'll just simply remove it. Uh, it might not get the tender love and care that, that one might expect, but for those who don't know, ADT, the uh, application display templates, allow you to provide your own uh, display template to be used for applications. <laughs> That's kind of the, but uh, so for example, the blogs portlet, uh, the way that it looks today, you can override that by writing a velocity template or a free marker template. Uh, and the templates are executed in a context where the templates have access to uh, the objects that are to be rendered. So for an example, for, an example, for a blogs portlet whose view mode is demanding to show 10 blogs, for example, then uh, when, you, when your template's executed, you can you know, say like dollar blogs one and dollar blogs two. Uh, and you can do for loops and you can create fancy looking displays for blogs. So. Well, and more, and more importantly, too, um, with the hook you did, it, you could get to the site level, and it would change the look for every instance of that portlet in the site. Looks like right. with the ADT, you can get down to the actual instance. Um, so different pages with those same portlets could have a different look, from what I understand. Yeah, you probably could. I don't. I, I, I have not explored that deep. Um, but yeah, uh, be a good question. Very exciting for, six two feature. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's it's a it's a cool one, and it's actually in the milestone already. So I assume that's where you tried it. 
Or the night, at least. I mean, like I said, I build my own, so. Yeah, or you can build off of trunk. That's your master, I guess it's called now. Yes, yeah, yeah. I've been trying to correct myself there as well with the change to GitHub. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Not the trunk, the master. That's right, master branch. Um, I was noticing uh, there was a lot of, I guess, accelerators around free marker too with those. So it seemed like maybe it's being the preference versus velocity. I have not uh, seen that, but I have. I don't really spend much time on trunk as far as um, looking at the what files are coming in and out of the workspace. Uh, I know that free marker is more forgiving of a language. Um, I tend to use velocity just because that was sort of the the only you know that was the, the default and the. That's what all of life ray stuff has been built in uh, traditionally in the past, but I know a lot of more people prefer free marker with its a uh, little more forgiving syntax. So that in the portlet isolation that sounds cool too. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I don't. I don't. Uh, I have not tried that at all. In fact, I don't even think it's in trunk yet. Um, so or I, haven't, I haven't seen it. So yeah, no, I still that's... think it's incubation. Makes sense. Or it's maybe you know mostly done, but uh, but not in trunk yet. So we'll see. I'll keep an eye out for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So those are, I mean those are two big features, uh, but there are many others like the calendar, um, and yeah, there's a bunch more. If you if you look at the milestone four, there's like 20 little features that were in it that were uh, brought in at that time. So that kind of gives you an idea. And also with our community development board, you can one click you can see exactly what people are working on. Um, of course, we don't publish roadmaps, and it's not because we're trying to be secretive. It's just that uh, priorities change over the course of the year. So um, uh, so we tend to stick with what's there now and what we're currently working on. And then what's coming up next is dependent on many different factors. So that's why we don't really publish a roadmap saying this exact feature will be here. We guarantee it. So, All right, so the million dollar question. So yeah. when we think, and we'll see six two. <laughs> <laughs> we we talked about it earlier. Oh, I must um, have missed it. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, that's all right. Uh, so we we try and do a release once a year, um, but if you look at our track record, uh, I think from six zero to six one was around fifteen months. Uh, so you know, we'll see how long. Uh, and then six one was released was released about. Uh, 14 months ago, so we'll Get see. Time is what you're saying? Yeah, I've heard it's around. It, we're shooting for the end of the year, but uh, I would not, I would not put any absolute faith in that because um, things, like I said, priorities change and things come up. So, oh, yep, I understand. Yeah, so that's the, that's <laughs> that's the best I can generally do. Well, that's um, all I was hoping for. So. <laughs> yeah. 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 So the, the next milestone build should be uh, at the end of this month for, for 6.2. And then at some point, you'll see we'll shift from milestone to, like, beta. And then we'll start doing release candidates. And then you know it's getting close. But there's no way to predict a life rate release this far out <laughs> these days. And I, I, I'm guessing the bug squad will be involved in that. Oh, yeah. Time. yeah. I mean, we already are. So... Uh, Bug Squad has been doing uh, milestone reviews uh, since milestone one, and also the community verifier team has been cracking down on uh, cleaning up some of the old uh, bugs to free our QA department to do uh, more interesting work instead of um, instead of trying to figure out if old bugs are are still appropriate. Because a lot of times in our community we have people who have more experience or they've been around li life rate longer than um, than some of our own, you know, employees, obviously, including myself. So it's good that we rely on the expertise that's already there in the community whenever we can. So, okay. Uh, anything else, Jamie, you want to add? Um, well, I think that covered, you know, what I have on my list anyway. Okay. Yeah, I see a comment in uh, in IRC. It's not a question, just a comment from Dave Nebinger about uh, free marker has always been preferred by LifeRay, but Velocity has a legacy base. It'll be hard to drop it. I think I definitely don't think we'll drop it, uh, but um, you know we'll start preferring it over time. And who knows? There's, I'm sure there's another template or uh, blah, blah, uh, templating engines and templating languages that we just haven't integrated into LifeRay yet that are even better than free marker and velocity, but 
those two are kind of nice because you, you can execute Java code, which I take advantage of many, many times. So I used so. it quite a bit in the themes, and we use it in the we use like the web content templates quite a bit. So yep. We've done it quite a bit with Velocity, so it's yeah. worked well for us. That's cool. Awesome. Uh, okay. Well, thanks, uh, Jamie, and uh, I think we'll move on to our next guest. Uh, All right. Great. Thanks for having me. Yeah. See you around. Yep. See you around. All right. <laughs> I love doing that. It never gets old. It never gets old. I tell, I tell that joke all the time. Okay, so the next um, next guest we have on is uh, Brendan Coleman so from TenGen. So I see you over there in the corner, Brendan. Hopefully we can hear you. You might be muted. Can you hear me now? Yes, and we have a massive echo. Oh, is there somebody? Is Francesca with you? She is. Oh, that's why. Hi. Hey, Francesca. <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to mute hers then, just for now, because um, it created a nice little feedback loop. So welcome, uh, Brendan and Francesca. Um, so why don't you start off by uh, introducing yourself, uh, what you do, what, um, and you know, we'll go from there. Wait, I don't. You muted you, Brendan. You are muted. You're still muted. You gotta push the little. There's a microphone button at the upper right. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Can you just press that? Uh, all right. Yeah, much better. Thank be you. Better. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Are we good? Yeah, we're good. Okay, perfect. So, um, yeah, so this this is no uh, stranger to people at TenGen. Um, for some reason, we're always growing too fast and growing out of our offices. So. <laughs> We're frequently in closets, um, but I'm Francesca, and I'm the community manager for MongoDB, and I'm here with Brendan Coleman. Hey, Brendan. <laughs> Hello, and I do business development. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, okay. So uh, what is 10 Gen? Because I don't know if everyone here has heard of you guys. I mean, so uh, Tengen uh, is the company that develops and supports MongoDB, um, which is one of the leading NoSQL databases. And um, so Tengen does development support and uh, also supports the community around uh, MongoDB. And um, we started in New York City in about 2008. And uh, we are now, we now have offices in about six different countries. Um, we have offices in New York City, Palo Alto. There are a number of people in Atlanta, and Brendan is actually um, one of the uh, employees in Atlanta. Um, we also have offices in London, England, uh, Dublin, Ireland, and in Australia. Nice. And we have employees all over the globe. <laughs> we have a number of employees in Germany, and few in Finland. Okay, awesome. Uh, and so you are the community manager for MongoDB. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Now, does Tengen have other products besides MongoDB? Yes. So one of the main products that we support is MMS, which is MongoDB Monitoring Service. We don't have a community manager for that yet. Um, but MongoDB Monitoring Service is really popular amongst uh, people that use MongoDB. It's, com it's a complimentary service offered by Tengen, and it gives Tengen engineers insight into uh, production users' MongoDB instances and gives them uh, proactive uh, support opportunities so that if your clusters are getting, you know, high CPU, the support engineers can see that. So it's a it's a support option that we offer for everybody because it helps them you know, help our users become successful. I see. Yeah, uh, MongoDB is, um, I, I don't know, arguably probably one the most popular NoSQL or NoSQL solution when people throw that, you know, keyword out. That's one of the first ones that come up. Um, and uh, um, and I, I guess I have to come clean. I did I did win a MongoDB backpack, so uh, I'm a bit biased uh, 
at uh, I think it was at OSCON last year. I helped some people install MongoDB. Uh, no, was it last year? I think it might have been the year before that. Years ago, yeah. Yeah, it's two years ago. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, uh, so so for MongoDB, how big is uh, is the MongoDB community? Like some of the metrics. So. Um... It's kind of hard to say how big the community is because MongoDB is open source, so there are a number of people that use MongoDB, but we're not entirely sure how many people use MongoDB. Um, but just some numbers to throw out there. Um, MongoDB is downloaded about 150,000 times a month um, and has been for the past two years. So that just gives you an idea of the usage. Yep. Uh, in terms of how many people are in our communities, uh, our MongoDB user group network has about 17,000 members, and that's growing every day. It grows at about um, a little under 1,000 each month. And we have over 10,000 people attend our conferences each year. And another statistic, we have about 50,000 people that have gone through our online education courses. Um, and these are free online courses that anyone can take to introduce them to MongoDB. So that's just some numbers on how big the community is. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, we've uh, we've seen uh, I guess a, a healthy uptake of uh, of users using MongoDB along with LifeRay. I know that Brendan is familiar with. Um, I guess we have a partner in common, uh, Signex, who have done some uh, implementations of uh, both, and we actually did a webinar earlier this year, or maybe it was last year around uh, using MongoDB to store LifeRay's document library documents uh, in a you know, scalable big data kind of presentation, um, which essentially amounts to a, 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 a fi uh, what is it called, a document library hook for MongoDB. Um, of course, there's, there's more to a full solution, but that's essentially what it is. Um, so, and also, um, Ray is, I think Ray, you're still, yeah, so Ray's still here. Um, Ray actually wrote a MongoDB uh, connector for Expandos. It was a prototype. <laughs> it's still a prototype. <laughs> yeah, so a prototype uh, uh, adapter for, um, for LifeRay uh, to use, not for document library, but for the um, Expando uh, database, because it was a pretty kind of a natural fit with, uh, with MongoDB being, you know, schemaless matched well with the schemaless nature of expandos. Uh, so, so yeah. Um, now, LifeRay itself is heavily dependent on a relational database at the moment. So, I was wondering if uh, if you or Brendan could um, talk about, um, you know, when it makes sense to use a non-relational database solution versus a relational database? Because one person might say, why don't you just swap out the relational database in LifeRay for MongoDB, and you know, all your problems should be solved. It's true. Oh, really? Well, then, awesome. Um, so, so what I typically tell people, and what um, a few people told me when I first started about MongoDB was, um, if you configure data into an Excel sheet, um, and if your data matches to an Excel format, which is, you know, two-directional, and that's, that matches typically what a rela how a relational database stores your data, then you should, you should be fine. If, if all you need to match is two different, um, if, if you need, just need to match two different rows to a column or one row to a column, then you should be fine with a relational database. But um, applications today are a little bit more complex. And... Certain things like user profile data or um, things like uh, log data, that type of information is a lot more complex and has a lot more, it has more fields and is more dynamic than data that we used to get in the past. So relational databases don't really hold up to that anymore. And that's when, when, when your data is expanding like that and when you have a number of fields that are associated with a certain object, then you should probably consider using um, an alternative database. And the reason why MongoDB works for so many use cases is because of its data model. MongoDB is known for having a dynamic schema, which means that we don't store documents, or we don't store information in rows and columns like most SQL data stores do. We store them in documents. And those are JSON-style documents. You can also call them objects. Um, 
but it matches um, it matches a number of fields to an individual object ID, and that makes it easier to do a whole host of other things. Um, a lot of the times, people start off using MongoDB uh, by testing out if it can hold their logs, and that's probably one of the best use cases for MongoDB because uh, log data has a ton of fields associated with it, and it needs to be timestamped. And in MongoDB, you have a UTF timestamp already integrated into the object ID. So you can easily sort your data and easily manage the many fields. So, um, but MongoDB has been used for a number of things. Actually, I put a short presentation together, um, and I can just like read off from this presentation. Then yeah, let you screen screen share it if you want. Okay, if yeah, it helps to yeah. For visualization. Yeah, it might help for um, for some people. So, okay, I'm starting the screen share. Let me know when you see it. Yep, I see it. Okay, cool. So as you can see, there's companies like SAP, Ericsson, which is a telco company, uh, Disney Company uses MongoDB for the games, um, the New York Times uses MongoDB in a number of departments, most in uh, content management for their photos. Um, eBay uses MongoDB for a number of projects, but what the first project they used for MongoDB was for photo metadata, and so all of the photos that are stored in eBay um, all that metadata, all that information, and as you can imagine, eBay has been around for a while. Tons of photos get uploaded to eBay every day. All of that's managed through MongoDB, and the project is called Project Zoom. Um, Carfax has a really interesting use case. Um, I think they store, they, they use they use Mongo to store all of their um, the tons of different types of data that normally wouldn't. Uh oh. You guys still there? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Coming back slowly. It's like you're shell shocked. Sorry, no, no, no. I was just looking at Brenda because, um, so Carfax stores all the data that you put into the forms when you fill out a Carfax. So when you when you fill out a, 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 vehicle a vehicle registration form. Sorry, I don't own a car. I live in New York. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it could be used for tons of, tons of different things. Um, so if that answers your question, you know, if, if you're if you're a company looking to if you're looking to expand in analytics or if you're trying to improve the speed at which your forms get uploaded or improve the efficiency with which you store your forms, um, or if you want to improve your content management and metadata management, you know, MongoDB might be a good solution for you. Now you guys also have um, a grid FS or grid file system. Mm -hmm. Which I, that's one of the things that Signex was talking about a lot, where you can store like a lot of data. So mm -hmm. that's sort of a different use case than you know a log file. Uh, it's yeah. we're, we're, so. Can you talk a little bit about like you know, do you, could you use? I mean, obviously you could use both, but why would someone want to use GridFS and you know the the other properties of MongoDB versus some other storage mechanism for large data? So GridFS, uh, for those that don't know, is a specification for storing and retrieving uh, files that exceed the document size limit of 16 megs. So the BSON doc at each BSON document can only hold 16 megs. Um, and if you want to store files that are larger than that, you use GridFS. And GridFS divides each file that you store into tiny chunks and stores each of those chunks as a separate document. So this is one of the reasons why MongoDB is so interesting, because in a SQL, you wouldn't be able to do that, because you wouldn't be able to store those items as individual entities and be right. able to grab them individually. So that's... Well, people, that's I'm sure, would try. Because <laughs> <laughs> LifeRay, I know there's, there's some uh, in LifeRay that some people store, like, giant XML documents as a field in a database. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, this is specifically because there is a... Uh, data, there's a limit on each BSON document. So, um, but that's what GridFS does. Um, but your original question was, why would someone want to use GridFS? To yeah, store instead of like, instead of storing it, you know, in some super fast SAN and then having a reference to it in the database. Oh, okay. Um, so the reason why is if you're going to have, I think, I think one of the reasons why people want that is because they want to have consistency with their the rest of their application, if they need to store the large files, it just makes sense to keep everything in Mongo. Yeah, I also can imagine that the, uh, the clustering slash HA capabilities, if you store everything in Mongo, then 
it's all you get all for free essentially since it's so branded simple to set up as well so yeah and then I mean I would say the other thing is uh, yeah having everything is native if you have one application, it just it just makes a lot more sense and makes everything a lot easier. Um, but but yeah, I mean people people really enjoy using uh, MongoDB. So I think if you can use it for as many, if if a team's using Mongo on one thing, they might not want to port all of their, for example, photos or videos to a completely separate database and have to worry about reconciling those two systems. Right, or buy an expensive SAN solution or some yeah. giant Oracle rack thing. Yeah, and if you want to keep your files and metadata automatically synced and deployed across the systems, then um, then MongoDB works because you can have geographically distributed replica sets. Um, right, and that that again takes advantage of the document structure across different parts and keep those items consistent. So, uh, yeah. So can you still see this screen? Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Keep going. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know if you guys want to go through some things about this presentation, but there's there's some interesting stuff in here. I don't know. Brendan asked me to put something together. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I think more information about MongoDB and more information about your community afterwards. I have a couple questions for you. Cool. Yeah. So um, one thing that uh, I get asked a lot is like, why should I learn MongoDB? What's the value for me? Um, I mean, MongoDB is just going up with, um, with everything. Um, oh, Ray, you're going crazy there, buddy. <laughs> Sorry about that. All right, Francesca. So, so um, in Google Search Insights and LinkedIn Job Skills, Indeed Job Trends, and uh, the JasperSoft Big Data Index, MongoDB is just off the charts. It is, um, uh, you know, in really high demand compared to the other relational databases. So, um, to that extent, MongoDB is a really, uh, you know, it's a really heavily desired uh, skill, and it's in very high demand. Um, so that's one of the reasons why. You know, we think you should learn MongoDB now. Um, also, MongoDB is made for many different types of languages. Um, it has native bindings in over 12 languages, um, and these languages, uh, you know, Perl, C++, .NET, Scala, Node.js, these are all supported by TenGen engineers. Um, so these are, you know, drivers that are blessed by us and have TenGen support on the back. Um, but then there's another, there's a ton of other um, languages that are not yet supported by Tendon, but have projects that are available in the community. Those are things like Erlang and Go uh, and R. So, you know, there's really any any type of driver you want to use that's out there. Um, it just might not be, you know, out of the, you know, 1.0 phase yet. Um, and it might be supported by some, you know, talented group of engineers that are in the community but don't work for Tendon. Right. Um, another thing, ooh, it was a puppy. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I'll go on mute. The other thing is that the technology has matured a lot. Um, uh, we just released MongoDB 2.4 a few weeks ago, and that um, has Kerberos support, which is a security authentication, um, capped arrays, uh, a beta version of text search, and hash-based sharding. Um, and that's going to be a really exciting release for us because it's going to give our customers a lot of interesting things to do with the technology. Um, and uh, certain things like hash-based sharding and capped arrays, it's just going to lead to a much better ops experience for a bunch of people that have been using Mongo for a while. Um, and if they're starting new projects on it, it's great because you have a very wide feature set associated. Um, another thing I would say is that there's tons of free resources for learning MongoDB. And one of those things is um, our online education courses. So we have a suite of free online education courses at education.tedgen.com. Um, the course that just started is MongoDB for Developers, and that teaches you how to use MongoDB through the Python programming language. And um, it's actually great because Python's really easy to use. People who have taken the course have said that it's they never touched Python before, but they felt like it was a great overview of Python and that they actually got to like Python a lot better. Um, and uh, it walks you through how to build a blog with MongoDB and Flask. 
which is um, a really simple um, Python web development framework. Now, um, I want to ask you a question about the hash based sharding. Not so much a question, just about like, so I used MongoDB, like I said, two years ago, um, and I had to generate my own shard keys. So is this feature, is this something where it's going to automatically generate sharding keys for me and make it nice and distributed across the replica sets? So the interesting about this is you still have to choose your shard key. So for example, if you were to shard on location, you would have to choose that. The only difference is that this automatically shards the location for you. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got gotcha. you. Um, okay, yeah, that's good. Yeah, it was a pain because, like, uh, it's, it's Ray, you might be able to, uh, to, um, yes. See, the longer I go on this webcast, the less my vocabulary starts to degrade pretty fast. Um, you might be able to relate to this, Ray. But uh, so the problem was that um, our essentially we had to do a hash across. Uh, a, a particular field in life rate because, uh, uh, yeah, I don't remember exactly what it was, but if there was a way in, in MongoDB for it to shard uh, for me, it would have been much better. And now I hear the airplane again. Sorry, is, is my microphone... Is that yours? Uh, okay. Um, Wait, yeah. so Brendan, Brendan wanted to add something on the hash-based sharding. Okay. So, so James, one of the things to keep in mind is what we've done with hash-based sharding, it, it allows choosing a shard key to be a little more forgiving than what you may have experienced two years yeah. ago. Um, as, as you would know living through it and anyone that's developed an app, uh, when you start scaling, choosing your shard key is ex extremely important and I would say one of the more difficult features of Mongo, so really understanding what that means. And, and not only that, but having a source of good, you know, shard keys so that it's distributed across the key space. Yep. So yeah, absolutely. And that's obviously we've we felt a lot of that pain because um, trying to migrate a system after six months in production and, and trying to rename a shard key is is not that easy. So uh, hash based is the solution now, and it's an improvement, but we're continuing to make that easier for the user and more robust, maybe, is the right word. Awesome. No, that's good. That's good. That was, I think that was probably the main issue I had back in the... I, don't, I think it was version like 1.7 I was using. Yeah, there's definitely yeah. been some improvements in 2.4, so... Awesome. Cool. Any other 2.4 questions? Uh, no question specific to two out four no, but we do have another question later, or if you want now. Uh, sure, let's do it now. <laughs> okay, the question is on IRC. So, what do you think is the primary driver causing NoSQL to become so widespread? Uh, I mean, I, I think it. I think I mean, I'll answer the question, but then I'll definitely give it to Brendan because he does talk to a lot of customers that are adopting NoSQL. Um, but I think it's what I said before is that. There's a lot. There's a lot of applications that are being built nowadays that just, or a lot of things that want to that people want to build nowadays that just don't fit into the relational model. Um, and there's, uh, you know, the relational model's also been around for 30 years, so there was a need for disruption, and there were a few disruptions. Like Postgres is definitely uh, a disruption to the SQL space, but it wasn't as big as you know MongoDB and a few of the other NoSQL options that are out there. Um, but I think now the way the web has changed and the way social has changed and the way mobile has changed um, and the fact that everybody has a 3G phone, there's a lot, uh, you can get a lot more information about people and, uh, you know, everybody uses the term big data and big data can mean a lot of different things, but one of the things that big data means is that you have a lot of unstructured data versus structured data that needs to work together. So I think that's one of the main reasons why MongoDB has gotten such wide adoption is because the data model is a lot more flexible and you can uh, manage your data without having to worry about how many tables or rows you have anymore. Um, yeah, it's almost, uh, sorry? Uh, I was going to say, it's almost like we've gone in the opposite direction. Like we went from analog records to CDs and now we're going from uh, uh, like, a, like a digital, when I say digital I mean like people couldn't really create 
they could consume, right? The web down, web 1.0. And mm-hmm. now on web 2.0, now they can consume. So there's just like an explosion of data because people are now creating. They're not just consuming. And yeah. so, right, the, you mentioned social, right? Social didn't exist. I mean, social networking as a, you know, as we know it today did not exist even, uh, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. So, yeah, so I, I definitely think that is driving the adoption of more flexible data represent you know data schemas and ways to represent data um, yeah so yeah Brendan what do you what do you think why do you think yeah I mean I think Francesca hit it on exactly if you were to ask it's kind of a two-part question so MongoDB specifically if you would ask any of our engineers or anyone that's used it and developed an app I mean the, the dynamic schema is, is extremely powerful um, and anyone would argue that I think right now I agree with that. So MongoDB is one piece, but if you look more broader, like at the NoSQL landscape, and you started to think about why it is gaining so much tr- traction, I think it resorts back to just in general, the, using the best tool for the job, where there hasn't been that many options, where traditionally in the past 10 years, it was a relational database, and then we had to do some type of hack or add some type of product on top of that. And my my life got really tricky from an app development standpoint, just adding additional layers of technology. So uh, I think in general, now that there's more options, um, people are able to select the right tool for the job. Um, And the job has changed, too. Exactly. So not to harp on unstructured data, but it is is a reality. So uh, nothing looks like an Excel spreadsheet. (laughs) <laughs> exactly. Yes. Facebook inboxes do not look like Excel spreadsheets. <laughs> That's very true. You say were you gonna add something, Ray? I was just gonna say we like uh, it was mentioned earlier. We spent about thirty years trying to jam a square peg into a round hole. That is the <laughs> relational model, and at some point uh, we hit a threshold where uh, I was watching a TED talk and uh, the gentleman said that every, the amount of human knowledge that uh, humanity creates is being doubled every 18 months. So you can just imagine that, uh, you know, uh, in the next 18 months, we're going to generate as much more information as what we generated in, in all of humanity before, in, in all of human existence before that. And try and think of the relational model where all that data has to sit in one instance of a schema, of a of a predefined schema in a database somewhere. Well, that's that's kind of hit the limit of the boundary that that you can get to. You know, you've hit the boundary there. Yeah. Uh, you know, of creating a physical device, one hard drive that's sitting somewhere that contains all of that data, uh, and so you have to think, okay, well, that model just doesn't work anymore. What a, what, where do we go from here? And I think that's where it kind of come, come boils down to. You have to realize, okay, I need 50 hard drives now. And how do, how, do I, how do I do that? What's the mechanism for that? And I think that's where, okay, relational just doesn't work anymore. Mm-hmm. So a uh, quick warning. Uh, we have five minutes before we actually are going to get hard kicked off of here uh, because of the four-hour time limit on Hangouts. So I had a, a couple of follow-up questions um, for you guys, if you're willing to stick around and come back uh, on the in the next session for a couple of minutes, but I'll ask now. Uh, I want to ask Francesca about the um, the community as a as a community manager. Of course, I'm a, I'm a bit biased towards wanting to know how uh, different communities relate to one another, uh, or you know how how we compare essentially. Um, so, could you tell me a bit more about the the makeup of your community? I know you mentioned uh, you have a large community that sometimes can't be measured because you don't always talk to the people using MongoDB, but uh, as far as like user groups um, and uh, community events that you may have in the near future. So yeah, so we have user groups. We have about 73 user groups and they're all over the world. You can see we have one in Hawaii. Um, I've never been to that one, unfortunately. (laughs) (laughs) We have a few around Africa. Um, The strongest one is Africa is in South Africa. Um, and, uh, you know, a bunch that sprouted up in Europe and a ton in the United States. Um, so, you know, there are uh, a bunch of really strong user groups, but most of them just started within the past year. 
Um, so they're all really young, and most of the makeup of those user groups are people who are looking to learn more about MongoDB. And the reason why most people start a user group is because they want to, you know, speak with more people that are using MongoDB and grow from there. So um, they're really awesome. If you live near a MongoDB user group, you should definitely go to the next meeting um, or message your organizer and you know suggest a topic for a future meeting. Um, so, um, but yeah, they usually happen once a month or once every other month um, in most of the cities around the globe. Um, so that's what our user groups are like. Do you have any more questions on that specifically? Uh, no, no. I just, uh, I, I mean, the map I think kind of answers it. Um, we have a similar situation in LifeRay where um, we have new, a lot of new user groups in the last year or two that have that have popped up. Some more active than others. Um, yeah. So, um, so I'll I'll, I'll ha ask another question at the risk of getting uh, kicked off here in a couple of minutes. Um, so, as far as the makeup of the uh, of the the developer community, um, you know, do you guys have external Committers or contributors, and if so, like you know, how, do, how would you characterize that that work? Well, uh, so MongoDB is written in C plus plus. So if you contribute to the core server, you're probably a really talented C plus plus developer, um, because kernel development is is not easy. Uh, so we do have a bunch of committers. Um, we have about 800 forks on the core server, um, and those are people who fork it to contribute back, and people who fork it to create their own project. And if they create their own project, then they have to go through the process on the AGPL to, uh, you know, get the get our license and our blessing for Mongo uh, being used in the wild. Um, but on, we have a bunch of, uh, as I mentioned, the language bindings for MongoDB. We call them MongoDB drivers, and there are about twelve official ones, and there's a bunch of other unofficial ones in different languages. Those are all licensed under MIT or Apache license. So they're a lot more liberal, and we have a lot of contributors on those. Um, I think one of the more active ones is in the Java driver, but we have a bunch of con contributors who help out with the Ruby driver and a bunch who help out with the Python driver. Um, I'd probably say that the Python and Java driver are the most popular. Um, and you know, anytime someone contributes, um, if uh, the driver engineer lets me know, we send them a cool T-shirt that has a contributor. Uh, it's like a, a little MongoDB document that says that you're a community contributor and a community champion. Nice. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to send a, another. I, I hate to interrupt, but I'm going to send another URL here in a moment. So Brendan, if you can, I'll send it to Brendan Francesca. I don't think I had you on the distro list. Uh, it's um, cool. Brendan will send it to me. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, I'm I'm actually really shocked that we haven't gotten kicked off. So. Um, nice. Yeah. Um, so what else? Do you want to do you want to learn a little bit about the some of the open source projects that are built with Mongo? Uh, that would be excellent, yes. So uh, there's a lot of open source projects built with MongoDB. Um, you know, there's a lot of companies that use MongoDB, as I mentioned, but I think my favorite part of the community is the open source tools that people build and open source on their own, and it kind of helps build the open source ethic out there and helps advocate for open source software as a whole. 